Hello guys and welcome to the first lesson in this Linux course and this lesson is a presentation and overview about Linux. So first of all I would like to ask a question and I'll give you five seconds to think about this question and this question is what do you think Linux is? Well, Linux is an operating system just like Windows, Mac, or Unix. And now that we know that Linux is an operating system, let's see what exactly is an operating system. Okay, now an operating system is a mediator between the hardware of the computer and the softwares or apps that you install. The operating system controls the resources that are in the hardware like for example the hard disk, the RAM, the processor, and manages them. In other words, if there is a particular app or software, as a user you want to run it. For example, an application like Microsoft Word. And this application requires 128 megabytes of RAM to run on. The operating system will reserve 128 megabytes of the RAM to give it to the application that you are running. Another example, if you are downloading an application which is 5 gigabytes in size, the operating system reserves this 5 gigabytes of size from the hardware for the application that you are downloading. Okay, now we know that Linux is an operating system. Let's have a quick overview on the Linux history. It is important that you know a bit of the history of Linux before you start. The first version of Linux has been released in September 1991. And it was made by a student that was in Helsinki University called Linus Torvalds. Linus Torvalds released Linux as an operating as an open source. And open source means that anybody can see the code in which the application was written with and edit it. Although you can't edit any open source application because each open source application has a license agreement. So now before you download any application that is open source, before you would like to use it and start editing in it, you must first see its license agreement. So you can see if you can edit in it, or you can only see its code without editing in it. So open source didn't start with Linus Torvalds. It started with Richard Stallman, this man right here, in, eight, in 1983. Richard Stallman was a researcher in the MIT, and he had ambition that the world will contain free applications that are open source, which gives the users the ability to edit in it and share those applications. Richard Stallman started the GNU project. He wanted to make a free open source operating system. He started the GNU project in 1991. He wanted to make a free open source operating system, but he couldn't reach the proper method or the kernel to make this operating system. In 1991, the GNU project made a lot of tools. One of the most important tools it made was the C programming language compiler, and it's called the GNU C compiler. Okay, now what is the link between Richard Stallman and his GNU project and Linus Torvalds and Linux? As said moments ago that Richard Stallman couldn't reach the proper method or the kernel to make this operating system. But Linus Torvalds did reach the proper method to start an operating an open source operating system. In December 1991, the 0.10 of Linux was released and to log in there wasn't any user or password and the operating system 0, 0.10 didn't support any hard disks except for the 80 hard disks as time moved on 
Linux started to spread wide and develop across companies and companies started releasing the kernel of the Linux for people to edit in it and develop it. Now Linux, Linux, uh, Linux is an operating system for many things including mobile devices, computers uh, in companies and personal computers and it is now trusted and used by many of the large known companies. Okay, now we know that Linux is an open source operating system. That means that any user or organization can edit in it. As time moved on, companies started to edit in Linux and release new versions according to the company's name. Like for example, Red Hat Linux, SUSE Linux, Ubuntu Linux. And each name over here is a distribution. For example, Red Hat is a distribution, SUSE a distribution, and each one of those is a distribution. And each distribution of those has a different release. For example, uh, sorry, I mean each distribution of those has different releases. For example, now there is Red Hat 7, there is Ubuntu 14, and so on. In this picture, there are some of the distributions of Linux. There are more than 50 distributions of Linux. Now, is there a big difference between the distributions? The answer is no. There isn't a big difference between distributions. You may only find slight changes in the commands and slight changes in the locations of the configuration files. There also may be differences in the security. For example, there is a distribution called Trustix which is mainly focusing on the security side of the operating system. Alright, now let's have a look at the Linux advantages. From the advantages of Linux is that it's free, but not all distributions are free. For example, Red Hat will give you its support by money, as well as SUSE, but all other distributions, either than SUSE and Red Hat, and the support are uh, free. Sorry, I would like to give a, a better example or make this statement more clear that the Red Hat gives its uh, support by money as well as SUSE, but all other distributions are free. From the advantages of Linux also is that it has good stability. You can have a Linux server that is working for a year without problems. It's easy to install. It works on any platform. It is more secure, which means less security risks. But of course, there is no operating system with 100% security. It has flavors. For example, if you want Linux for desktop, then you will go for Ubuntu. You want Linux for server, you would likely go for CentOS. If you want to test a penetration test for your operating system, you will go for Kali Linux. One of the best advantages is that Linux does not slow down over time, unlike other operating systems that may slow down over time. It has many free softwares and it installs softwares easily. Okay, now Linux also has disadvantages. If you are a new, if you are, if you are a new Linux user, you may take some time to learn Linux, but that doesn't mean that Linux is hard to learn. After you see this course, you will realize that it isn't hard to learn Linux. When you come to Linux, most applications that you deal with in other operating system, for example, Windows. You will forget them when you come to Linux and you will find applications in Linux that are similar to those that you are used to in Windows. Of course, of the disadvantages is the technical support. That if you have a problem, you will have to research it in Google or ask a friend. But be sure that it, it's most likely that any problem that you will face, probably another user has faced the same exact problem and have shared the solution across the internet. 
Okay, as you can see over here, these are very large companies that use Linux as an operating system. For example, you have Google, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, McDonald's, and even NASA uses Linux. Schools, colleges, and universities in Germany, Russia, India, Pakistan use Linux. So, as you can see that most or a lot of the big companies or the large companies around the world actually use Linux. Okay, so now why CentOS in this course? Well, CentOS is a free distribution and it has all of the features of Red Hat distribution. It has good stability and it has good speed. Thanks for watching and I hope you find this lecture of good benefit for you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about the Linux file system hierarchy. Okay, now why do we need to know the Linux file system hierarchy? Because you need to know where do you store your files in Linux. And as you see there are many directories in here and we need to know what is the function or the role of those directories. Okay, the first thing we have here in Linux is the slash or the slash root. Uh, the root is the location in which the Linux is installed with all its directories and content. Under the root or the slash root, you will find the rest of the directories. So the root is the basis. Any directory will be under slash root. The first directory we have over here is the bin directory. So if you double click on the bin directory to open it, in here you will find the essential commands that any user can execute in the Linux. For example, here in the search, if I type cd, as you, as you see it will take me to the cd command. Right now I will go back to the root. Okay, the second directory we have over here is the boot directory. The boot directory contains the essential files that are used by the Linux operating system to work. Inside the boot directory you will find the kernel file for the Linux. Okay, over here we have the dev directory. The dev directory contains any device as a form of file because the Linux sees any device in the form of a file. In the dev directory you will find any hard disk that we have attached to the Linux, any CD-ROM and any flash memory. Then the next we have here is the etc directory. The etc directory contains all of the configuration files of the Linux. I'll click on it. Okay, now for example here if I search, sorry about that, if I search for, uh, for example, the word host name, it will appear for us the configuration file of the host name, the name of the machine that we are working on. If you change this name, for example, to Linux or Udemy, then the machine name will be changed according to the name that you have typed. So the etc directory contains the configuration files of the Linux. Okay, so I'll click on this button here to get back to the root. Right, now we have here the home directory. The home directory, any user that you create on Linux will have a home directory inside this home directory. If you get inside the directory, you will find as you see the user that I have created previously. Okay, now here is the lib directory. The lib directory contains the library files. In this directory you will find the modules of the kernel 
and some files that are shared between applications on Linux. Okay, now the next directory uh, over here is the MNT or the mount directory. In this directory you will find any media that you add to the Linux either if it is CD-ROM or flash memory. Uh, this directory over here is the proc directory. The proc directory contains files that have information about the operating system or the machine that we are working with or working on. Now for example if I click to open it and then I search for CPU it will get me to this information files as you see here there is this file CPU info and this file contains information about the processor the type of processor and the processor catch right now I will get back Okay, now to the root directory. Here I have the root directory and this is the home directory for the user root. And now there is a difference between the slash root and the directory root. The slash root is the location in which the Linux is installed with all its directories and content. But the directory root is the home directory for the user root and the home directory of the user root is not in the home directory of the normal users for security reasons. Alright here the sbin the sbin directory like the bin directory the sbin directory saves all of the commands that are executed by the system administrator that has all the permissions in the Linux I'll click on it and for here for example if I type F disk okay here it appeared for me the F disk command the the command F disk that is used to partition the hard disk this command cannot be executed except by a user that has all permissions on the system okay now I'll get back to the root here is the TMP directory the TMP directory contains temporary files and directories that may be used by an application for a temporary period of time or you may be installing an application that may need to store some files here until the installation is complete and because they are temporary files and directories the moment you reboot the system all of the files and directories that are in here get deleted so it is required or recommended that you don't store important files in the TMP directory because any user can access this directory and edit its files. Okay, now to this directory over here, which is the var directory. The var directory contains files that grow in size as time goes by, like the log files and the mail files if you have a MySQL database. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about building your lab on VirtualBox, the lab that we will be running Linux on during the rest of the course. The preparation of the lab will contain an overview on VirtualBox so that we know what is VirtualBox and a bit about virtualization kinds of virtualization and the privileges of VirtualBox. And the next step will be the installation of VirtualBox in Windows. And then we will see how to create your first virtual machine.
and then the installation of CentOS on the virtual machine. Okay, now what do you think VirtualBox is? Well, VirtualBox is a software that gives you the ability to work with several operating systems on your computer at the same time. And it does that by using the virtualization technique. As you can see over here, I am working on Windows 7. And in the VirtualBox, I am running CentOS 7. So now, as you can see over here, there's a simple explanation of VirtualBox is that it's a virtualization software. But before talking about virtualization, let's take a look at the pre-virtualization. Okay, so as you can see here in this picture, this is a picture of pre-virtualization. This is the normal case and the normal layers of a computer without the virtualization layer. So you can see in this picture are the layers of the computer. And here we have the first layer, which is the hardware layer. And this layer contains the RAM, the hard disk, and the processor. The second layer contains the operating systems that you are running. For example, Linux or Mac or Windows. And the third layer is the layer that contains the softwares and applications that you download and install on your operating system. Each one of us has a hardware in his personal computer and is working on an operating system, for example, Windows, and you have some installed softwares like Microsoft Word, Firefox, and so on. So now let's see what is virtualization and what is the virtualization layer. Okay, now as you can see in this picture, there is the hardware layer in the beginning and this is the called uh, and this is called the physical hardware this layer includes the processor the ram the network card and the hard disk now above the hardware layer there is the virtualization layer the virtualization layer has the ability to convert hardware layer into a virtual hardware this will result into having a virtual ram a virtual hard disk, a virtual network card, and a virtual processor. Now what else does the virtualization layer do? The virtualization layer gives me the ability to install more than one operating system at the same time on one computer. And each operating system has a virtual hardware reserved from the physical hardware. For example, here above the virtualization layer, I have two operating systems. For example, this one over here is Windows and this one over here is Linux. Each operating system of those is using a virtual RAM, a virtual hard disk, a virtual processor, and a virtual network card that are reserved from the original physical hardware. And of course the virtualization layer or the virtualization software is the software that does this operation. This is what I'll be doing in this course. I am working on Windows but I'll install Linux on a virtualization software for practice which is the VirtualBox. Of course there are many other benefits of virtualization but this will require a full course about it and it isn't the main subject of this course. Okay, now a brief explanation of virtualization is that it's a software which gives you the ability to run more than one operating system at the same time. So this is exactly what the virtual box is. Okay, now what are the kinds of virtualization? There are two kinds of virtualization. The first kind is called bare metal and the second kind is called hosted. In the first kind we have the hardware layer and then above this layer there is the hypervisor layer and then above the hypervisor layer you can create virtual machines. Each virtual machine has its operating system and each virtual machine has its resources from the physical hardware. 
Okay, the hypervisor here is a software and here are the bare metal hypervisors. We have examples like the VMware ESX. There is the Oracle VM. We here have the Zen that is used in the Amazon Web Services. And we have Hyper-V from Microsoft. And there is KVM from Linux. The second kind which is the hosted in the hosted we have the first layer which is the hardware layer and then above the hardware layer there is an installed operating system for example Windows 7 or Windows 8 and then I install the hosted hypervisor on the operating system which will be the third layer as you can see over here and then from the hosted hypervisor I start creating virtual machines and each virtual machine has its operating system. In here we have some examples on hosted hypervisors like of course the virtual box, the Oracle virtual box. And you can see that there is the VMware server, the workstation, the fusion, there is the Microsoft virtual PC and some others over here like the Colinux and the KVM. Okay, so now we know what is VirtualBox and a bit about virtualization. Let's talk more about the VirtualBox. Now currently VirtualBox belongs to Oracle and you can download it from virtualbox.org. It is a free software and you can install it on Windows, Mac or Linux. As you can see over here, this website is www.virtualbox.org and from here you can download the virtual box. If you click here on downloads, it will open for you the download page and from here you can download virtual box for Windows, for Mac, for Linux and for Solaris. Okay, now here are some advantages for the virtual box. The first advantage for virtual box is that it's free. It can run more than one operating system at the same time. You can run on it 32 bit and 64 bit operating systems. And last but not least is that it doesn't require hardware virtualization. And this is an advantage for people who have PCs that don't have processors that support virtualization. They can install VirtualBox on their PCs and run more than one operating system at the same time. But now all of the new PCs have processors that support virtualization, either if the processor is Intel or AMD. I hope you find this session beneficial for you. Thank you for watching and see you in the next lesson. Hello guys and welcome to our first lesson in this course. I hope that you are excited just like me to start our journey learning Linux together. In our first couple of lessons, we will install our lab so that we can practice what we will learn together uh, on this lab. In our first lesson, we will see together how to install virtual box on uh, Windows machine. So to install VirtualBox on Windows machine, just go to virtualbox.org and you will see here an image uh, with the current VirtualBox uh, release, which is VirtualBox 7.0. To download the uh, VirtualBox package, just click on the link. And under VirtualBox uh, platform packages, you will see different packages for different operating systems. In this lesson, we will focus on uh, installing the VirtualBox on Windows machine, uh, but also I will add some useful resources to this lesson uh, so that you can install VirtualBox on Mac OS, for example, or uh, Linux uh, distributions. So to uh, download the VirtualBox uh, executable file, just click on Windows Hosts, which I already did. So here I have the executable file. I will click on it. And once you click the executable VirtualBox file, you will see 
the uh, wizard so I will just click next and here you don't need to modify anything except if you want to uh, modify the location uh, which you will install a virtual box to so if you want to uh, modify this location just click browse and select your new location for me I will just install the virtual box under uh, program files Oracle virtual box so I'm happy with that I will click next here you will get a warning message about network interface telling you that during uh, a virtual box installation the network feature will reset your network connection and you may be disconnected uh, from uh, the network for me I will just click yes here here the missing dependencies uh, are optional if you want to extend virtual box functionality so in case of uh, this is a requirement for you you need to first install the Python core and when 32 APIs otherwise just do as I will do now and click yes if you are ready to install VirtualBox and if you are happy just click install and it will take like a couple of minutes to finish the installation now as you can see VirtualBox has been installed successfully and to start the uh, uh, VirtualBox just click here and click finish and here is the uh, uh, VirtualBox uh, manager so right now we are ready for our next lesson see you then Hello and welcome to our second lesson. We're still preparing our lab environment for this course. We learned together in our previous lesson how to install VirtualBox on Windows operating system. In this lesson, we will create our virtual machine, which we will install Linux on it. To create uh, our first virtual machine, I will open Oracle VirtualBox. Then I will click new here. And I will give this machine a name. It will be Linux and in the folder you can specify where you will store uh, this virtual machine uh, files like hard disk and everything related to this virtual machine for uh, the ISO image I will not select ISO image at this stage uh, so here I want to install Linux operating system you can install anything else or other operating systems using VirtualBox for example you can install uh, Microsoft Windows Linux Solaris and so on for the purpose of this course I will select Linux then uh, from the uh, version I will select Red Hat 9 64 bit then next here in the hardware specification, uh, you can select uh, the memory dedicated for this virtual machine. I will keep it on uh, 2 gigabytes, and also you can select how many CPUs you will assign for uh, this virtual machine. I will keep it as one CPU. Let's click next. In the virtual hard disk page, you can uh, select to create a virtual hard disk and you can give it here a disk space I will make it 50 gigabytes then next now we have created our first uh, virtual machine inside virtual box uh, as you can see here if you uh, select the virtual machine you can see uh, its information you can see its name its operating system you can see the system specification like uh, the RAM and you can modify any of uh, those settings by uh, doing right click on the virtual machine then settings or you can select the virtual machine and click settings here you can change uh, things like the name of uh, the virtual machine is the type of the operating system and the version of the operating system from system you can uh, uh, increase or decrease the memory you can uh, uh, reconfigure uh, the processor assigned to this virtual machine also from storage you can attach uh, more than one hard disk to this uh, virtual machine or you can attach uh, an ISO as a, a CD-ROM for this virtual machine and from network you can uh, enable or disable the network adapter you can uh, enable up to four 
uh, network adapters for each adapter you and for example you can attach any of the network adapter to NAT or bridge adapter for example let's click cancel because I don't want to uh, modify any of the settings for this virtual machine and by this we finished uh, our lesson see you in next lesson we have seen together in our previous lesson how we have created our first uh, virtual machine. In this lesson, we will see how, uh, or we will learn together how to install uh, Rocky Linux uh, inside our virtual machine. Uh, to do so, let's first attach uh, the Rocky ISO to this uh, virtual machine. But before attaching the Rocky ISO first, uh, you will need to install uh, Rocky Linux from rockylinux.org and you can go to the download by clicking here uh, you will find uh, Rocky Linux 9 and Rocky Linux 8 uh, you will find Rocky Linux 4 uh, x86 64 uh, architecture and R uh, so uh, for the purpose of this lesson I will download the uh, ISO for architecture x86-64 uh, so just click minimal here and it will be uh, downloaded to your uh, uh, laptop or PC now let's go back to VirtualBox to attach the ISO I will select the virtual machine then I will click settings then from storage under controller IDE I will click empty then from this icon here I will select it then choose a disk file and I will select uh, my ISO image for uh, Rocky then open then OK to save my new configuration and to uh, as you can see this virtual machine is powered off to uh, start this virtual machine I will select it then click start now we have started uh, our Linux virtual machine and as you can see here you have the option to install uh, Rocky Linux uh, 9.0 uh, but before continue with the installation process let's uh, view this in a scaled mode just to make it bigger for you to see all options and at any time you want to uh, exit the scale mode just to click right control and C letter now let's go to the scale mode again ok now to install Rocky Linux I will select install Rocky Linux 9.0 and click enter now we will get the installation uh, welcome message uh, to connect your mouse inside uh, this virtual machine just click uh, the left click on mouse and select capture now you can move your mouse inside the virtual machine to exit uh, and to go back with your mouse to your original laptop just click right control and you will uh, manage to move your mouse in normal mode so let's now select our language it will be English United States I will click continue and here I will uh, configure the root password so let's select the root password I will click enter then I will type my root password and I will confirm the password and as you can see here uh, here is a message that I didn't select uh, a strong password and it tells me that I will have to uh, click the done button here twice so I have no problem uh, with that and you have two options here the first one is to lock root account and the second one is to allow root SSH login with password I will allow the root SSH login with password then let's click done and I will click it again and from the system I will 
select the installation destination and from here you can partition your hard disk i will not i will not do that so i will click done and now as you can see i can begin the installation also you can change uh, the time and date from here you can add another uh, keyboard or you can for example uh, configure the hostname from network and hostname i will not do uh, any of uh, those right now so i will just click begin installation it will take some time so i will pause the video then i will come back uh, once it finish uh, welcome back and as you can see now the installation progress is uh, complete so now i will just click reboot system now as you can see we have installed the rocky linux and here it asks for our uh, user to login so I will just type root and I will provide the password we have configured together during the installation uh, process then press enter and now uh, we have successfully logged into this uh, rookie Linux and by this we finished our lesson see you in the next lesson hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux this session is about the ls command first of all you will check your path over here as you can see the word root this means that i have signed in with the user root and then you can see here after the at sign the word localhost and localhost this means that we have signed in to a machine by the name localhost and this tilde sign over here means that I am in the home directory of the user root. Okay, so now I want to display the content, the files and directories that I have here under the home directory of the user root. And the command to display this is ls. So now I have typed ls, I'll press enter. And as you can see, it displayed for me the files and the directories that I have over here. The ones that are in black are files and the ones that are in blue are directories. And those red ones are compressed files. Okay, now if you have hidden files or directories and you want to display them, then you will add an option to the ls command and this option is minus a. So you will type ls minus a and enter. And as you can see over here, more files and directories have appeared. And you can notice that the hidden file or directory will have a dot in the beginning of its name. For example, this is a hidden directory over here. It has a dot in the beginning of the name. And you can see also that there is a file over here it has a dot in the beginning of its name All right. now there is another option that you can add to the ls command to display more details about the files and directories for example the details uh, like permissions the date in which the file or directory was made and so on and this option is minus l so you will type ls and then minus l and enter and as you can see it displayed for me the results it displayed for me the permissions first this section here is the permissions and this section here is the the user of the directory and or the the directory's user and the directory's group and here you have the size of the directory by bytes and this section here is about the date and here the date this is the date in which the directory or the file has been made or it is the date of the last update that has been made to the file 
So for example, if I made an update for this file over here today, then this date will change from whatever it is now to the date of today when I changed the file. Okay, as you can see over here that you can see the difference between the file and the directory. The directory is in blue color and the file is in black. But in some cases you may find all of them are the same color. So how to know the difference between a file and a directory? From here in the permissions part, the first character if it's a directory, then you will find the first character by the letter D. And if it is a file, then you will find the first character as a dash. So from the first character, you can know if it's a directory or a file. If you find a D, then it is a directory. And if you find a dash, then it is a file. Okay, now there is another option that you can add to the ls-l. And this option is minus H and the minus H option is used to display the size of files and directories in a better way. So when you type LS minus L, it will display the size only by bytes, as you can see over here. But the option minus H displays the kilobytes and the megabytes and so on. So for example here if I type ls and then combine the option minus l with h. So now here it's ls minus lh, the option minus l to show me the details and the option minus h to display for me the size in a better way. I'll press enter. And as you can see over here now that the size have changed from bytes to kilobytes. And of course, if you have a file that has the size of about million bytes, then it will display megabytes for you and so on. Okay, now I'll clear the page by the command clear. Okay, now there is an option that you can add and this option is minus T. The option minus T displays the files and directories in an order from newest to oldest. So now if I type ls minus T and press enter, then you can see that it is from newest to oldest by this order. So it goes, this is the newest and this is the less newest and so on like that until the last file. And you can display it in another way if you type ls minus l and t together. Then you can see it will display for you from newest to oldest in the order from the date as you can see over here. Okay, now the last thing we will see in this lesson is that when you type ls in a normal condition, just ls and then press enter you will see that it will display for you in an alphabetical order. You can see that it starts with a file that starts with A and then C and D and goes on like that and then another D, D and then F and so on to the V. It goes this way in alphabetical order. You can display the files in a reversed alphabetical order if you type LS minus R and enter. And as you can see, it has displayed for you the content in a reversed alphabetical order. It started with V and then T, P and all the way to the A. And by this session we have seen the LS command for displaying files and directories. Thank you for watching. See you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about the cd command. The cd command is the command to change between directories. First of all, I'll type ls to display the contents that I have over here. Okay, now as you can see that the blue are the directories and the normal color, the black color are the files. 
For example, I would like to get to this directory over here, dir1. I will type cd and then dir1 and enter. And as you can see over here that the terminal is telling me that I am in the directory dir1. I'll type ls to check out what's inside the directory dir1 and enter. And you can see that there's another directory over here by the name dir a. And notice here that when you type the name of a directory, for example, now I would like to get to directory dir a, I will type cd dir a. And uh, notice that when you type the name of the directory, if there is a capital letter, you must type it capital as it is because Linux is case sensitive. I'll press enter and now as you can see I am inside the directory dir a okay now how can I go to another directory under the slash root for example the desktop directory over here I would like to get to this directory so to get to this directory I will type cd and then slash root and then slash desktop and of course if you are using Linux then you will probably be using the command CD all the time and in here because I'm in a different location I am in dire A I had to type the full path of the directory that I want to go to and I'll press enter and as you can see here in the terminal it tells me that I am inside the directory the desktop directory okay now if I type CD and then two dots this means that I'm telling the terminal to take me one step back so now I'm in the desktop if I press uh, if I type the command cd and then do dots and then enter this will get me back one directory which will get me to the slash root I would like to get to the directory dir a the one that I was in before so I will type cd and then dir1 and then slash dir a and notice that this time I did not add a slash here before the dire1 because dire1 is under the slash root the place where I am in right now already so I'll press enter okay now I am inside dire1 so now if you are in, a, in any directory and you want to go back to the home directory of the user that you have signed in with which in this case it's the user root then you will just type the command cd notice that I'm inside two directories right now I'm in dir1 and inside dir1 dir a and this is my location right now in dir a the command cd will take me to the home directory of the user which in this case the user root so I'll press enter and as you can see it took me back to the user root if I type ls I will find myself in the home directory of the user root thank you for watching and see you in the next session hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux uh, this lesson is about the pwd command and the pwd command is the command that shows you your position and where you are Okay, so now first I will type ls to display the directories and files that I have over here. And let's for example go to this directory over here, dir1. I'll type cd and then dir1 and enter. Okay. Now the pwd, pwd over here is the shortcut or the short word for print working directory 
So now I have typed the command pwd and I'll press enter. And as you can see, it have told me where is my path. I am under slash root under slash dire one. Okay, for example, now I'll type ls and enter. And I found another directory inside dire one by the name dire a. So I would like to go to the directory dire a. I'll type cd and then dire a and enter. Okay, now let's try the pwd command again. I will type pwd and enter. And as you can see, it displayed for me the path that I am under slash root, under dire1, and then under dire a. Okay, now what is the use of the pwd command? A lot of time when you are working on Linux, you enter and change between many directories to execute commands or check up files and then in the middle of all of these operations you suddenly get lost and forget in which directory you are on so you type the pwd command and it shows you the full path of where you are and by this lesson we have seen the pwd command thank you for watching and see you for the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about making directories using the mkdir command. Okay, first of all I'll display the files and contents by the command ls. And now I would like to make a new directory. I'll type mkdir and for example type dir4 and then enter as long as there isn't an error message after you execute the command this means that the command has been executed successfully I'll type ls and you can see over here that the new directory that I have just made by the command mkdir dir4 here is the directory dir4 Okay, you can also create more than one directory at the same time using the same command. You will type mkdir and then for example dir5, dir6, dir7 and enter. And by this command I'm telling it to create uh, three directories at the same time, dir5, dir6 and dir7. I'll type ls. And as you can see over here, I have dire, six, uh, dire 5, dire 6, and dire 7. It has been successfully executed. Okay, now you can also use the mkdir command to create a directory in a different location. For example, I would like to create a directory in the desktop directory. Then I'll type the command mkdir and then the full path of the location. As you see here is the desktop directory over here. And I would like to make a directory inside the desktop directory while I am in my place, while I'm, uh, while I'm in my location. So I will type mkdir and then the full path of the location which will be slash root and then slash desktop and then slash dire 8 and of course dire 8 this will be the directory that I want to create inside desktop which is this directory over here which is under slash root so you type the full path and then enter and of course as we have said if there is no error messages this means that the directory has been created successfully okay now you can install several directories inside each other or under each other I'll type ls and then now I have for example I would like to create a several of directories inside each other so I will type mkdir and then dir c slash 
dir d slash dir e and enter and as you can see it has stated for me an error message no such file or directory to do this option you must add an option by the name to do this command you must add an option by minus p so you will type mkdir minus p if you want to create directories inside each other and then you will type drc slash drd slash dre and enter as you can see it displayed no error messages for me I'll type ls okay you can see here that here is drc I will get into drc by cd cd drc and enter and ls here is drd the second one that we have created I will go to drd also and then ls and you will find the last one dire which it's here in the command dire c and inside of dire c there's dire d and inside of dire d there's dire e and here it is as you can see if i type pwd and enter you can see that here is the path i am in dire d uh, sorry I, I need to get inside dire c first i'll type ls uh, sorry, I mean dire E, and then I will type cd dire E and enter. Okay, now if I type pwd and enter, it will show me that I'm under slash root, under dire C, under dire D, and finally I am in dire E. And by this lesson, we have seen the mk dire, the command to make uh, directories. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next lesson. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about the touch command. And the touch command is a command used to create files. Okay, now for example I'll type ls first and as you can see here we have the directories and files as you can see in front of you. I would like to make, create a new file by the name file1 so I will type the command touch t-o-u-c-h and then file 1 and enter I'll type ls one more time to be sure that the file is created and as long as you don't see an error message after you execute an, a command this means that the command is executed successfully I press enter and as you can see here it came the file file 1 now you can also create more than one file at the same time by the same command you will type touch and for example I would like to make file 2 file 3 and file 4 so here I am telling the terminal that I want these three files to be created at the same time and I'll press enter okay now I'll press on ls to be sure of it and as you can see the files are successfully created as you can see over here okay now what if I want to create a file in another location or inside another directory for example I would like to create a file inside the desktop directory over here so to do so while I'm in my location I will type touch and then the full path of the directory which will be slash root and then slash desktop and then slash and then in the end the name of the file file.txt and enter and as you can see it did not show for me any error messages so I will type CD and then desktop and enter and from here I'll type LS and as you can see the file has been created successfully inside the directory desktop and by this lesson we have seen the touch command 
Thank you for watching. See you in the next lesson. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about how to remove files or directories by the rm and the rm dir commands. First of all, I'll type ls to display the contents that I have over here. Okay, now first of all, what is the difference between rm dir and rm? The rm dir over here is the command used to remove directories, but it can't be used to remove files. While the rm command can remove directories and files. Okay, now I would like to remove the directory dir2 for example. So I will type rm dir and then dir2 and then press enter. And as you see, it didn't display any error messages. So this means that the command has been executed successfully and the directory has been removed. If you type ls and enter, you can see that the directory has been removed from here. Okay, let's for example now try to remove directory dir1 over here. I will type the same command again, rm dir and then dir1 and enter. And as you see, it displayed an error message that the directory is not empty. And this means that I can't remove a directory that contains files or directories by using the rmdir command. So the rmdir can only remove empty directories, while the rm command can remove directories that contains files and directories. But before we get to that, let's have another quick example. Okay, so I would like to remove the directory dir6 and ls as you can see it has been successfully removed from here. Okay, now I'll clear the page and display the contents one more time. Okay, now to the rm command. Now the rm command can remove files and directories. So now I remove the file file 3 for example over here with the rm command. I will type rm and then file 3 and enter. As you can see it will ask me remove regular empty file file 3. If I press on y this means yes and if I press on n this will mean no. So let's give it a no first and we will try the command one more time and this time I'll give it a yes. Okay, and now if you type ls, you can see that the file, file3 has been removed from here. Okay, now let's remove a directory. For example, I would like to remove the directory dir7 by the same command, rm. So I will type rm and then dir7 and enter. And as you can see, it's telling me it cannot remove dir7 is a directory. And that's because you will have to add an option to the rm if you want to remove a directory. And this option will be minus r. So I will type rm minus r and then dir7 and then enter. And it's asking me if I want to remove the directory dir7. So you will press Y to proceed and then press enter. Okay, so now dir7 was an empty directory. What about if I type the same command for a directory that contains files and directories? I will try with a directory that contains a file and a directory, which is uh, this directory over here dir1 so I will type rm minus r and then type dir1 and enter okay it's asking me to descend into directory dir1 if I press on y and enter 
it will ask me to remove the rest of the contents inside the directory to dire A I'll press Y and enter it will ask me if I want to remove the regular empty file kick this is the name of the file which is inside the directory dire 1 I press Y and enter and now in the end it's asking me if I want to remove the directory dire 1 so first of all it asked me if I want to remove the directory dire A which is inside dire 1 and then I give it a Y so this means yes and then it asked me if I want to remove the file kick which is also inside the directory dire 1 and then I pressed Y which is which means yes and after I have removed the directory and the file that are inside the directory dire 1 there are no more directories or files so the last step now is removing the directory dire 1 itself which contained the the file and the directory so now I'll press on Y and then enter and as you can see it has removed the directory dire 1 and the directory and the file that were inside the directory dire 1 so under the directory dire 1 we had a directory by the name dire a and we had a file by the name kick it asked us first to remove the directory and then remove the file and then remove the directory it's like step by step from deeper to outward outward until you remove the whole directory and all its contents okay now I'll clear and ls okay now the last time I have removed the file it has asked me a question if I'm sure if I want to remove it or not so now what if I want to remove a file without the terminal asking me if I am sure then I'll add the option minus F so this time for example I would like to delete the file file 2 I'll type rm minus F and then type file 2 and this time it will not ask me if I'm sure I if I want to delete this file or remove this file because I have added the option minus F I'll press enter and as you can see it has removed it if I type ls and take a look you will see it's not in here okay now I would like to see a summary of the process of removing a file or directory then I'll add the option minus V and I also don't want it to ask me about if I'm sure if I want to delete it which means that I will add minus F so this will mean that I will combine the option V and F together with the RM command and let's try this with the file file 4 I'll type RM minus VF and then type file 4 so this means that I'll combine two options the option minus V and the option minus F the minus V to show me the process or the summary of the process uh, so yeah it's the summary of the process yes and the minus F so that it won't ask me if I want to delete it or not and I'll press enter and as you can see it have gave me a summary over here removed file 4 so in here as you can see I did not add the option minus R because this is not a directory it's a file okay now I would like to remove a directory and see the summary of the process and I don't want the terminal to ask me if I am sure so for example I would like to remove the directory dire 3 over here so I'll type rm minus r in the beginning because this is a directory I have to add the option minus r and then the option of v because I would like to see the summary of the process and then f so that it won't ask me if I'm sure if I want to delete it or not and then I'll type d i r 3 the name sorry about that 3 the name of the directory that I would like to remove here and enter and as you can see it showed me a summary of the process that the directory dire 3 have been removed and by this lesson we have seen the rm and the rm dire commands to 
remove files or directories. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about the cp command. The cp command is used to copy files and directories. To do so you will type the command cp and then space and then the name of the source and then space and then the destination that you want it to be copied to right now let's have an example in this I'll type ls and uh, now I would like to take a copy of the file 1.txt which is over here 1.txt and take a copy of it to the directory dir4 and enter All right now I'll type cd dir4 to get to dir4 and ls and you can see that the file has been copied successfully okay now let's copy several files at the same time notice that I am in a different location right now I am inside the dir4 directory and I would like to copy some files I would like to copy the files 2.txt, 3.txt, 4.txt to a directory so I will type the command cp and then slash root slash dot txt and notice that this time I'm typing slash root because I'm in a different location I am in dir4 I am not under slash root I am under directory 4 and of course directory 4 is under the slash root but these files are directory under slash root they are not in dir4 which I am in right now so I have to type the full path of the file and then slash root slash 3 dot txt and slash root sorry about that slash 4 dot txt and then slash root slash dire 4 the directory which I am in right now so by that I am telling the terminal that I want to copy the files 2 dot txt 3 dot txt and 4 dot txt that are under slash root to the directory dir4 which is also under slash root and in here I have typed the path of the files and the directory because I am in a different location as you can see here I am under the directory dir4 and I'll press enter okay now I'll type ls and you can see that it has copied the files for me under the directory dir4 over here okay now there is another way to copy files without having to type this last part of the destination which is slash root slash dir4 I want to get a file to copy it to my location without having to type the last part of the destination so for example I would like to copy this file over here file 2 I will type cp and then slash root slash file 2 and then space and then I'll just type a dot and I'll press enter and this command means to copy this file for me in the directory that I am in right now so I will type ls and you can see that it has copied for me the file to in the directory that I'm in right now All right now I'll clear the page and ls okay now let's have a look at copying directories you have seen how to copy a file let's take a look at how to copy a directory I would like to copy the directory dir5 to DIRC for example let's try typing CP and then DIR5 to 
DIRC and enter and as you can see it has resulted in an error message and that's because there is an option that you must add to the CP command if you want to copy a directory and this option will be minus R so I will type CP minus R and then dir5 DIRC this means that I would like to copy the directory dir5 into DIRC and I'll press enter as you can see there is no error messages I'll type CD and then DIRC and enter and now I'll type LS and enter and as you can see that it has uh, took me to DIRC and it has copied for me the directory dir5 successfully inside DIRC Okay, now let's have one last example. I would like to copy the directory dir a, for example, into the directory that I'm in right now, which is dir c. So there are two ways that you can do it. You can type cp minus r and then slash root slash dir a and then the destination, which is root slash root sorry and then dir c which I am in right now or the second way that you can do it is that you type the same comment but without the destination you will just add a dot and enter if you type ls right now you can see that it has bought for me it has copied for me dir a to dir c the location where I am in right now Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This session is about moving files and directories using the mv command. So to move a file or directory you first type mv and then you type the source and then you type the destination that you want the file or directory to be moved to okay so now first of all I'll type ls to display the contents that I have over here and now for example I would like to move the file 1.txt to the directory documents so unlike copying if I want to copy the file it will leave the same file over here and it will copy it to the uh, directory documents but moving is not like copying moving it will take the whole file and move it inside the directory documents so to move the file I'll type mv and then 1.txt and then type the name of the directory documents and enter all right now if I type ls as you can see the file 1.txt doesn't appear here any longer okay let's get to the directory documents I'll type cd then documents and enter and then ls and enter and as you can see the file has been moved successfully to the directory documents okay now I'll get back to the home directory clear the page and ls okay now I would like to move uh, a directory to another directory for example I would like to move the directory dir5 to the directory drc so I will type the same command mv and then dir5 drc and enter okay now it's asking me if I want to overwrite the dir5 directory because there is another directory by the same name dir5 inside drc so if I press if I type y and then enter this means that I'm telling it yes overwrite it and if I type n this means that I'm telling it no do not overwrite it 
Okay, now I will type n for now, enter, so it didn't overwrite it. There is another command or another way so that you can move a file or a directory to another directory without letting it ask it, uh, without letting it ask you if you want to overwrite it or no. So if I type mv and then minus f and then type dir5 and then dir c and then this command means that I'm telling the computer if you find a directory by the same name in the destination do not show me this error message and just proceed so I'll press enter and as you see it did not show me any error messages okay now you can add an option for the mkdir command which will show you the summary of the process of the transfer sorry about this mistake the mv command not the mkdir command you can add the option of minus v okay so now I would like to copy some files to another uh, destination so I will type mv minus v and then for example the file 2.txt the file 3.txt and the file 4.txt and as you can see these are the files 2.txt and 3.txt and 4.txt and for example I would take them to the directory downloads so I'll type downloads and the minus V over here is the option that shows the summary of the process I'll press enter and as you can see it showed me a summary of the process that just happened that those files have been moved to this directory over here and in this lesson you have seen the MV command for moving directories and files thank you for watching and see you in the next session hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux this lesson is about changing the names of files or directories using the MV command first of all I'll type ls to view the files and directories that I have okay now for example I would like to change the name of this file over here from file 1 to another name for example I would like to change it to file.txt so I will type mv and then the name of the file that I want to change which is in this case file 1 and then the new name next to it I'll type file and then dot txt and enter okay now I'll type ls to check if the change is made and you can see over here that the file 1 has been changed to file.txt of course you can do the you can do the same for a directory now for example I would like to change the name of a directory this directory for example DIRC so I'll type the MV and then DIRC and change it to DIRF and enter now I'll type LS to check out and as you can see the directory DIRC has been changed to DIRF and by this lesson we have seen the MV command for changing names for directories and files thank you for watching and see you in the next lesson hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux this lesson is about the cat command the cat command is used to display the contents of a file and some other uses that you will see during the lecture so the cat command is typed like that cat and then you type the files name for example here I'll type slash etc slash password and this is the name of the file that I would like to view by the command cat it's called password and uh, it is the password file this file contains all of the names of the users that I have here in the Linux 
and I'll press enter. As you see it displayed for me the contents of the file here in the terminal. If I go up from here, if I go up from here, as you can see here the command has been executed cat slash etc slash password. And then it displayed for me the results in the terminal as you can see over here. Okay, now let's have another example. I'll clear the page first and I'll type cat slash etc slash group. And here the file group, this file contains all of the groups in the Linux and I'll press enter. And as you see, it displayed for me the contents of the file here in the terminal. If I go up a little bit, you can see that here is the command has been executed, cat slash etc slash group, and here is the result. Okay, so this is the way to view a file, is to type the command cat and then the path of the file or the name of the file. Okay, now you can also use the command cat to create a file. Let's type ls to display the contents that I have here. Okay, now I would like to make file with the name torque.txt for example. I would, I would type cat and then the bigger than sign and then torque.txt and enter. As you see here it gave me space to type the name or type whatever the contents that I would like to be inside the file of torque.txt. I can type here anything, but I would like to leave the file empty, so I'll press on control and then C. Right now I will type ls to be sure that the file is here. And as you can see the file is successfully created over here, torque.txt. Okay, now I'll clear the page and ls one more time. Alright, now I would like to insert uh, or add a content in the torque.txt file. I will type the same command one more time, cat, and then the bigger than sign, and then torque.txt, and enter. And in here I will type anything, for example, hello, my name is torque and I like Linux and after you have finished you will take one uh, enter you will go to the next line when it's empty and then you press on control C okay now I would like to view the contents of the file torque.txt so I will type cat and then torque dot txt and enter as you can see over here it's telling me the contents that I have wrote over here hello my name is Torque and I like Linux okay now I can also use the command cat to copy the contents of a file to a new file For example, I would like to copy the contents of the file password in another file. So I will type cat and then slash etc slash password and then the bigger than sign and then I will type password. Sorry, it's password, not password dot txt. And by this command I'm telling it to copy the contents of the file password and place it in password.txt and enter. Okay now I'll type ls and as you can see over here that the new file password is uh, created password.txt. I'll type cat and then password.txt and enter. And as you can see, it displayed the contents of the file for me.
And by this session we have seen the cat command. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about the less command. The less command is used to display the contents of a file, but it's a bit different from the cat command. If you remember the cat command displays the file's content in the terminal. For example, if I type cat slash etc slash password and enter it displayed for me the results uh, it displayed for me the content of the file but as you can see it's in the terminal outside because you can see that the command is over here but the last command sort of opens the file or enters the file itself so this time I'll type less and then slash etc slash password and enter and you can see that in here I am inside the file itself I'm not in the terminal outside so if there is more than one page that is displayed then you will press on control F to get to the next page and if you want to get to the previous page you will press on control B Okay, now if you want to search for a particular word, then you will press on slash. As you can see, as soon as you press slash, it will give you the option to write something here. And for example, I'll type anything for a type NTP and enter. And as you can see, it took you to the line where it found the word NTP. And of course, if you type slash and then type anything, after it for example RPC and enter it will take you to the to the locations where it found RPC in it and after you have finished viewing the file that you like you will press on Q to get out of the file and as you can see you are back outside on the terminal so by this session we have seen how to open a file with the less command thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about pipes and redirects. Okay now first of all let's talk about the pipe. As you can see this is the pipe sign. Sorry about that. This is the pipe sign as you can see you press on the shift and the backslash on the keyboard the backslash button is under the backspace button okay now pipes are used to combine several commands together by taking the input of the first command and making it the input of the second command Okay, now let's have an example on that. If I just type ls and enter, this command will display for me the content that I have. But first I'll, uh, I'll get to the home directory and I'll clear. Okay, now we all agree that ls is the command to display the contents that you have in the directory that you are in. Now I will use the pipe to combine the command ls by taking its output and making this output the input of another command. Okay, now let's try ls alone. I'll tr I'll type I have typed ls and I'll press enter. Okay, so this is the result of the ls command. This time I'll try to type ls and then pipe and then type for example the command less okay now as you have seen in a previous lesson the less command is the command that displays the content of a file so by this command here 
I am asking the shell to display for me the result of ls, the output, which is the content. This is the result of the ls command. I am asking the shell to display for me this result in less. So the command now, the output of the command ls or the result of the command ls is being the input of the second command which is less. So this means that this result will be displayed in less. I'll press enter and as you can see the result of the contents of the ls command has been displayed in less for me. I'll press on Q to exit and I'll clear. Okay, now let's have another example. You know, if you type ls minus l and enter, it will display for you the content in more details. Right now, I'll type ls uh, minus l and then I will pipe it with the cat command. Okay, now here this command means take the result of the first command and make it input to the second command. In other words, take the result which will come out from this command and display it in cat for me. I'll press enter. And as you can see, it has displayed it in cat for me. And I'll clear the page. Okay, now let's talk about the redirect. The redirect sign is this sign, the bigger than sign. And redirection means to take the output or the result of the first command and save it in a file. So it is a command and then redirect and then the name of a file. Now let's have an example for that. I'll type the command ls and then I would like to redirect it and save the, the result that will come out of the command ls in a file by the name ls.txt and I'll press enter. Right now if I type ls and enter you can see here that a file appeared by the name ls.txt. Now as you can see that the file name with txt I will display it with the cat command. I'll type cat and then ls.txt and enter. And as you can see it displayed for me the result of the ls command. So by this session we have seen the pipes and redirects. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about archiving in Linux. And archiving means that you collect a number of files and directories and put them together in an archived file by the extension tar. The use of archiving is when you collect a number of files and directories in a single file, you can then use this file as a backup for your data. It's like a container and you can save this backup in a flash memory or on a CD ROM or save it in another place on the hard disk. Okay, so now let's first display the files and directories that I have over here. I'll type ls. And now, for example, I would like to archive the documents directory over here. So to archive, you will type the command tar minus cvf and then the name of the file after it's archived documents dash backup dot tar and of course you can change the name here to anything but the extension must be dot tar and then the directory that you want to archive the directory or file that you want to archive in this case I would like to archive the documents directory so now I'm telling it to, to archive the documents directory 
and then name the archived file as documents-backup and as I said of course you can change here the name to anything but the extension must be .tar and enter okay now I'll clear the page and then ls and enter and as you can see here I have the archived file of the directory documents okay now what is the use of this for example an error happened and the documents directory has been removed I will type for example now rm minus rvf and then remove the documents directory okay as you can see now the documents directory have been removed after the documents directory has been removed I still have the backup or the archived file okay now I would like to get the data back and the directory and its content how can I get this archived file back to its normal state or in other words extract the archived file to extract the archived file you will type the command tar minus xvf and then type the name of the archived file that you want to extract which is in this case will be documents dash backup dot tar and the option X over here is uh, the option of extraction and you will press enter okay now I'll clear the page and I'll type LS and as you can see it showed me the documents directory back again it has extracted the file and returned it to its normal state the documents directory okay now there is a command that you can use to view the content of the archived file before you extract it for example you have several archived files and you are searching for a particular file or directory and you need to know the content before you extract it so to know the content of a directory or uh, sorry of an archived file and view its contents you will type the command tar minus T V F and then the name of the archived file which is in this case documents dash backup dot tar and enter and as you can see it has shown for you the contents that are inside this archived file there is another thing you can do with the tar command you can also add another file or directory to this archived file for example this is the archived file that I have and I would like to add this file over here password.txt to this archived file so to add a file into the archived file you will type tar minus rvf and then the name of the archived file and then the name of the file that you would like to add in this case password.txt and then you'll press enter okay now let's view its contents we will type the other command the, the first one over here the, the one with the tvf and this displays the contents of the archive file and press enter and you can see here that the password.txt file has been added to the archived file so by this lesson you have viewed the tar command thank you for watching and see you in the next lesson hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux this lesson is about compressing files by the commands gzip and bzip2 the gzip and the bzip2 are two different ways each one of them uses a particular algorithm in the compression process. The gzip compresses quicker, but the bzip2 uses less space for the compressed file. 
Okay, now first of all, I would like to make a directory to practice the compression on. I'll type mkdir and then type compression. For example, I would name the directory compression and enter. And then I will get to the directory compression by the command cd. And of course here if you type ls you won't find anything because it's just a new directory. So I would like to create files with a large size to try on it the compression process. And I will do so by the command sec. This command sec if you type for example sec and then 10 and then press enter. This will make the terminal count from 1 to 10. If I type sec and then 100 and then enter, this will make the terminal count from 1 to 100. Okay, now I'll clear the page. So to make a large file by this command, I will type sec and then, for example, 1 million. And then make a redirection to a file by the name million.txt so here by this command I am telling the terminal to count for me from 1 to 1 million and then save the result in the file million.txt which will result in a file that contains the number from 1 to 1 million and of course this will make the file with a large uh, size and I'll press enter Okay, now I'll make another file, but this time I will make it 2 million instead of 1 million. And for example here I'll name it million2.txt and enter. Then make a third file and name it million3 and for example here I'll make it 3 million. Alright, now if you type ls. As you can see, I have three files, million2.txt, million3.txt, and million.txt. Okay, now I would like to see the size of those files. I'll type ls minus lh and enter. And as you can see, it displayed for me the size of each file in megabytes. You can see that million2.txt has 15 megabytes in size million3.txt is 22 megabytes and million million only.txt is 6.6 .6 megabytes okay now i would like to compress the file over here million.txt so i'll type gzip and then million.txt Okay, so now the file million.txt before the compression has the size of 6.6 .6 megabytes. I'll press enter. And now I'll type ls minus lh one more time. And as you can see over here, the file has been compressed. And this time its size is about 2.1 megabytes. Okay, this time I'll try to compress two files at the same time. I'll type gzip and then million2.txt and million3.txt and enter. Okay, now I'll type ls minus lh and enter. Okay, now you can see that the three files have been uh, compressed. And you can see that there is a difference in the sizes of the files. The million2.txt was 15 megabytes, now it's 4.1. The million3.txt was 22 megabytes, now it's 6.1. And of course million.txt was 6.6 .6 megabytes, and now it is 2.1 megabytes. I'll clear the page. Okay, so now we have seen how to compress files by the gzip command.
Let's see how to extract them. I'll type ls one more time to view the files that I have and then I'll type gzip and then minus d and first I will start with uh, for example this file over here million dot txt dot gz and I'll press enter now I'll type ls one more time okay now you can see it has been extracted one more time there is another command also that you can extract with it and it is called the g unzip so now I'll type g unzip to extract the other file I'll type g unzip and then million two dot txt dot gz and enter and if you type ls you can see that it has been extracted successfully I'll clear the page right now I'd like to make another file to try the bzip2 command on I'll type sec and then 3 million Okay, and then the redirection sign and then the file name for example million3.txt and enter okay now the file has been created successfully if you press ls you can see that here is the file over here but I would like to change the name of the file by the command mv I will change it to million three new dot txt and enter ls okay so now we have this file the new file over here million three new dot txt okay so this file has exactly the same content as this file over here but this one is compressed uh, sorry this one is compressed with gzip and now I will try to compress this one with bzip2 command and let's see the difference between them in terms of the space or the size after the compression I'll type b sorry about that I'll type bzip2 and then million 3 new dot txt and enter okay now I'll type ls minus lh and you can see that those are the two uh, files that have exactly the same content but one with the bzip2 and it has less size than the other one that is compressed with the gzip this is 6.1 megabytes the gzip and the one with the bzip2 is 3.4 megabytes okay now I'll compress more than one file at the same time by the command bzip2 I'll type bzip2 and then million dot txt and million two dot txt and enter and I'll clear the page and then type ls Okay, so now we have those two new files have been compressed to bzip2. And now the same as the gzip, you can extract with the command the gzip. In the gzip, you can extract with the command g unzip. With the bzip2, you can also extract with the command b unzip. So I'll type b un zip and then million two dot txt and enter okay it seems that I have made a mistake over here okay it's a spelling mistake it's uh, supposed to be b unzip and I forgot the two b unzip two and then the name of the file million two dot txt and enter
okay this is another mistake that I have made after the dot txt I have to put the extension bz2 I'm sorry for this mistake so you will type b unzip 2 and then the full name of the file with the extension of course never forget the extension and then press enter and now if you type ls you can see that the file has been extracted successfully and by this lesson we have seen how to compress and extract files with the gzip and the bzip2 thank you for watching hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux this lesson is about how to archive and compress by the command tar okay first of all I'll type ls to display the contents that I have here now for example I would like to archive and compress the directory public and give it the extension gzip or bzip2 Okay, now I'll archive and compress the directory and give it the extension gzip and to do so I'll type the command tar minus zcvf and then type the name of the file after I want it to be compressed and archived. I will name it for example public-gzip.tar.gz and then I'll type the name of the directory that I want to archive and compress and notice that in here I have added minus Z and this minus Z is the option to compress the file in uh, gzip and I'll press enter okay now I'll type ls and as you can see now I have the file compressed right now I'll clear the page okay now this time let's compress the same directory with the command tar but this time with the extension bzip2 so I will type tar minus j c v f and then give it a name for example this time I'll name it public dash bzip dot tar dot bz2 and then the name of the directory which is public and notice that this time I have added minus j in the beginning so the j here indicates that I want it to be with bzip2 extension not gzip so minus Z is for B, uh, gzip extension and minus J is for bzip2 extension and I'll press enter okay now I'll press ls and as you can see I have two uh, compressed and archived files of the same directory one with bzip2 extension and the other with gz extension Okay, now let's see how to extract those archived and compressed files. I'll delete the public directory first. I'll type uh, rm minus rvf and then type the name of the directory. Okay, as you can see now, it is removed. If you type ls, you will not find the directory over here. And I'll try to extract one file of those two files. Let's, for example, extract the one with the gzip extension. So I will type tar minus xvf and then type the name of the file. Dot tar dot jz and he, this uh, option over here minus x of course is the extraction option 
and tar minus xvf this command is used to extract both types of extension either if it's gzip or bzip2 so now i'm extracting the gzip extension file and i'll press enter okay now i'll type ls and as you can see the directory appeared again for me after it has been extracted okay now I have extracted one file which is the gzip file you can also view the contents of the archived and compressed file so let's see how to view the contents of an archived and compressed file in the bzip extension file I'll clear the page first and ls okay to view the contents of an archived and compressed file you will type tar minus t v f and then the name of the file which is in this case public dash bzip and then dot tar dot bz2 and enter and as you can see it has displayed for me the content of the file which is the directory public and you can know that this is a directory because there is a d in the beginning of the permissions as you can see over here so by this lesson we have seen how to archive and compress a file with the command tar by the extension bzip2 or gzip and how to extract them and also how to view the archived and compressed files content. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to a new lesson in Linux. This lesson is about making softlink shortcuts. A softlink is a shortcut. It is a file that points to another file, much like a shortcut in Windows. Note that softlinks do not contain data in the target file. It only points to the original file on the system. Okay, so first I'll display the contents that I have here. I will type ls and enter. Now I would like to make a softlink for this file over here, torque.txt. But first let's display its contents. I will type cat and then torque.txt and enter. All right now to make a soft link for the file I will type the command ln and then minus s and then I will type the path for the file that I want to make the soft link for I'll type slash root and then slash torque.txt so over here the file torque.txt is the file that I want to make a soft link for and then I will type the destination that I want the soft link to be saved in so I'll type slash root and for example I will choose the directory desktop slash desktop and then the name of the soft link after it's saved I will type for example torque and then dash shortcut and then enter before I press enter by this command I'm telling the terminal that I want to make a soft link or a shortcut for the file torque.txt that is located under slash root and place this shortcut or this soft link in the directory desktop which is also under slash root and I'll press enter and as you can see the file has appeared over here torque dash shortcut and there's a small arrow sign as you can see over here if you press here on this link it will take you to the original file which is torque.txt as you can see over here it has opened for me the file torque.txt okay now I'll change the directory I'll get to the desktop 
directory and I'll type ls minus l okay as you can see over here the file is in blue color words stating torque dash shortcut and this bigger than sign and the dash is pointing at the file that this shortcut is from which is torque.txt that is located under slash root you can display information about the shortcut by the command stat so you will type stat and then type torque dash shortcut or the name of the the file that you have the soft link for the, sorry the name of the soft link itself and then press enter and you can see it has shown me some details over here it's telling me that uh, it is a shortcut and here you can see the word symbolic link and here are some other informations about the uh, the soft link right now I'll clear the page and I'll get to the home directory of the user root by the command cd and ls all right now this time I'll make a soft link for a directory for example here the public directory and place the soft link in the desktop directory so I'll type the command ln minus s and then slash root slash public and then I'll type slash sorry about that slash root slash desktop and then the new name after the the new the name of the symbolic link or the shortcut for example I will name it public dash shortcut and I'll press enter and as you see it has appeared over here public dash shortcut the symbolic link and if you click on it it will open the directory for you but of course the directory is empty so you won't find anything and it's under the uh, home as you can see over here all right uh, now I'll get back to the desktop directory one more time I'll type CD then desktop and enter and then LS minus L okay now so because these are just shortcuts for the original files so when you make a change in the name of the original file or directory then the shortcut will not be able to see it because it's just a pointer to the original file so let's have a look at that I'll change the name of the file torque.txt by the mv command I'll type mv slash root slash torque.txt and then slash root slash torque.old so by this I am telling it to change for me the name of the file torque.txt which is under slash root to the name torque.old under slash root also and I'll press enter okay now I'll type ls minus l and enter and as you can see here the shortcut the shortcut turned to red and was highlighted and this indicates that it can't see the file if you click here on the shortcut file the torque dash shortcut file if you click on it as you can see it will display an error message it's telling me it could not display torque.txt right now I'll clear the page All right now I will change the name back to its original state I'll type mv slash root slash torque dot old 
and change it back to the original name which is torque.txt and press enter and now ls minus l and you can see that the shortcut is now working again normally because now it can see the file that it is pointing on All right now let's see how to remove a shortcut or a symbolic link to remove a symbolic link you will type the command on link and then the name of the symbolic link or the shortcut torque dash short cut and enter as you can see now it has been removed from here and if you type ls minus l of course you won't find it and let's also remove this one over here I'll type the same command unlink and then I will type the name of the symbolic link public dash short cut and enter and as you can see also it has been removed from the desktop over here and by this lesson we have seen how to make a symbolic link thank you for watching see you in the next lesson hello guys and welcome to a new lesson in Linux this lesson is about hard links so the previous lesson was about soft links and we have seen together that the soft link is just a shortcut a pointer to the original file this lesson is about hard link and the hard link command is ln and unlike soft links a hard link is a reference to a location in the file system itself let's see the difference between hard link and soft link so first of all I'll display the content that I have over here by the command ls right now I'll try the hard link on the same file as the previous lesson the file which is torque.txt I'll display the files content first by the command cat right now I have displayed the content of the file I'll start with the soft link first and then I'll make the hard link to see the difference between both so to make a soft link you will type ln minus s then slash root slash torque.txt and then type the destination slash root slash desktop and then slash torque dash soft link and I'll press enter and as you can see that the file has appeared over here torque dash soft link and you can see that the small arrow sign All right now I would like to display some information about this soft link which is located under the directory desktop so I will type ls minus l and then slash root slash desktop and then slash torque dash soft link and enter and in here as you can see I have typed the full path of the file because I am in a different directory right now as you can see over here it's telling me some information about the soft link and it's telling me that it's, it is just a shortcut for the original file and it's telling me that the torque dash soft link is under desktop and under slash root okay now I will take a hard link for the same file I will type the command ln for the hard link you will type ln without minus s and then you will type slash root 
slash torque dot txt the file and then the name of the uh, the, the destination that you want the file the hard link to be in and I will name it for example torque dash hard link and I'll press enter okay now as you can see the file has appeared over here and notice that in the hard link there is no arrow sign like the soft link over here and that's because the hard link is not a shortcut hard links refer to a specific location of physical data so now I'll get to the desktop directory and let's see the differences between soft link and hard link okay so I'll type CD and then desk top and enter and from here I'll type LS minus L to display the contents okay as you see over here the hard link here is different from the soft link the hard link is like a file it's not like a shortcut it has exactly the same size as the original file and it also has the permission at the beginning there is a dash like the permissions of the file so now I will type ls minus l and then slash root slash torque uh, sorry about that dot txt and notice here that I'm adding slash root because I am in a different location so I have to type the path of the file and I'll press enter and you can see here that exactly the size is the same of the hard link is exactly like the file and the beginning of the of the permission is also a dash exactly like it so now the hard link takes exactly the same properties as the original file it has the same size it has the same permissions so the hard link is not a shortcut the hard link clones the file with exactly the same properties and another thing is that if you make a change in the hard link then this change will be automatically applied in the original file so now I'll open the hard link file from here and for example I will copy this and I'll paste it a few times okay so as you can see I have pasted it a few times and I will click on save okay now it's saved I'll close the file okay now I have made these changes and saved let's go check out the original file I'll type CD and two dots to get back to the home directory and clear the page then LS and now I'll display the contents of the file by the cat command I'll type cat and then torque.txt and enter and as you can see the changes have been applied to the original file okay now I'll get back to the desktop directory I'll type CD and then desktop and enter and LS minus L and now I will type stat torque dash hard link and enter and the first thing you can see over here is unlike the soft link in the soft link you will find here it's written symbolic link but here in the hard link it's written regular file so this is one of the changes and you can see that the permissions here is 644 and the size is 282 bytes okay so now let's see the difference between the hard link and the soft link if I delete the original file I'll clear the page first
All right, I will type rm and then the path of the file. I will delete the original file, torque.txt. It will ask me if I want to remove it. I'll press on Y and then enter. And LS minus L. Okay, as you can see that the soft link has an error now. If I try to open it, the soft link, it will tell me that it can't see, it will state a problem that it, it can't see the original file. As you can see over here, if I try to open it, it's telling me the file is of an unknown type. Alright, now I will open the hard link. And as you see, the hard link worked without any problems. It wasn't affected from removing the original file. So this is a difference that if you remove the original file, the soft link will not work, but the hard link will work without problems. Okay, so now to the last part, let's see together how to remove a hard link. All right, now to remove a hard link, you will type the command un link and then torque dash hard link and enter. Now I'll type ls. And as you can see, it has removed the hard link. But as you can see over here, if you notice, there still another file that is called torque-hardlink and there is a tilde mark over here. What is this file? This file is a copy of the hardlink file before any changes have been made to it. If you display the content of this file, if I type cat and then torque-hardlink and then tilde and enter, you can see the result of the file before I change anything in it. So before you decide to make a change in the hard link, the Linux takes a copy of it so that if you need to get back to the original hard link that you took in the first time, you will find it. And by this session we have seen the hard link. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hello and welcome to a new lesson. In this lesson, we will start learning how to manage local Linux users and groups. Users and groups are used for access control. Also, every process running on the system runs as a specific user, and every file on the system is owned by a specific user. So access to files and directories on Linux systems are restricted by a user. Let us start our lesson and let us see how can we get an information about any user on the system. Let's type id mtorque. The id command is used to show information about any user on the system. Now press enter. As you see here, we have got some information about the user mtorque. We have information such as the user id, the group id, and the groups that user mtorque is one of its members. Right now, the user mtorque is a member in one group named mtorque. When you create a user on the system, a group with the same name as username you are creating will be created automatically. Also, this group id will be the same as the user id. As you see here, the user mtorque user id is 1. Thousand and the group mtorque group id is 1000. Now let's run ls minus l slash temp command to view the user associated with the file or directory inside the temp directory. Now press enter. As we have learned from one of our previous lessons, the ls minus l option lists file and directories with more information about each file and directory. And from information we are seeing right now, we can determine the user that associated with any file or directory. So for example, the user who owns the anaconda.log file is user root. And the user who owns the hsbearfdata underscore mtorque is user mtorque. Now let me clear the screen.
Now let's type psau command to list all processes that are running on the system. The U option here is to list the user that is associated with the process. Now press enter. As you see, the first column shows the username that is associated to the process. You can know the process from the last column. Let me clear the screen one more time. Now let's check the files that store all information about all local users on the system. Let's run the following command cat slash etc slash password. Okay, as you know, the cat command will display the content of password file. So what is password file? The password file is the file that store information about any local user on the system. Now press enter. Okay, as you see here in the last line, there are seven fields separated by colon. So let's check each field from the left side. The first field stores the username and the password were kept in the past in the second field. But now all passwords stored in another file named shadow. And it's also in the slash etc directory. The third field stores user ID and each user in Linux has a unique ID. In the fourth field, you can see the user's primary group ID and we will talk about groups after a while. The fifth field stores the user real name and you may find this field null. Now to the sixth field, which shows you the location of users' personal data and configuration files. Now to the last field, which stores the shell for each user. And from here, you can know if this user has access to shell or not. For example, user mtorque has a shell access because in the last field we have slash bin slash bash. But if you looked up, for example, for user sshd, which is a service, it has no access to shell because in the last field we have slash sbin slash no login. Now let me clear the screen. Now let's talk about the groups in Linux. Groups is similar to users. Groups also have a name and a number. And all groups are stored in slash etc slash group file. So let's display the content of group file using the cat command. So I will type cat. Now press enter. Okay, as you see here in the last line, we have four fields separated by colon. The first field shows the group name, the second field for password, and the password is not used here. In the third field, you can find the group ID. Now to the last field, which lists the users that are member of this group. As we see here, the group mtork has only one member and this member is user mtork. If you notice, you may see the fourth field as null if the group has no members as in this group tcb dump, there is no member in this group. Let me clear the screen. Now we talked about the users and the groups in Linux. We also have seen the password file and the group file. So let's create our first user on the system. But first, let's go to the home directory. Let's type cd slash home. Now run the ls command. Okay, as you see, we have only one home directory for user mtorg. Now let's switch to root user because the user root is the user that has privileges to add users to the system. But we may add this privilege to another user and that's what will we see in our future lessons. But for now, let's switch to the root user. To switch from mtorg to root type su, you can also type su dash both commands su and su dash are used to switch from any user to the root user. Now press enter. As you see, the system asked for the root's password. So let's type password for user root. Now press enter. 
Now we have switched it to the user root so we can add a new user to the system. Let's type user add then Ali. So this command will create a new user named Ali on the system. Now press enter. We didn't get any error message, which means that our command added the new user. Now let's check what happened on the system. First, let's run ls minus l. Sorry, first let's go to the home directory. So I will type cd slash home and I will clear the screen. Now let's type ls minus l. As you see, we have a new home directory for the new user. And the home directory has the same name as the username. The home directory name is Ali and the new username is Ali2. The system automatically create a home directory for the new user with the same name as username. And the default user home directory located under slash home directory. Also, please note that the user Ali and the group Ali are the default user and group for Ali's home directory. Now let's check the password file. So let's type cat slash etc slash password and press enter. Okay, as you see here in the last line, Ali has been added to the password file. And let's remember that password files store information about all local users. Please note that user Ali has the user ID 1001. And if you noticed that user mtorque has the ID 1000. So the next user you will create on the system will get the ID 1002. So any new user created get a user ID incremented by one number from the last user ID. Also let's take a look at the last field here where is slash bin slash bash. So from here we can notice that any user created using the user add command has an access to the shell. Now let me clear the screen and let's check the group file. So I will type cat slash etc slash group. As you see here in the last line, the new group named Ali has been added to the group file. So we have seen together how to add a new user to the system. And we have seen what's happened when we added a new user. Now let's Clear the screen and let's run user add minus minus help. Now press enter. As you see, we can add many options to the user add command. So take your time to test those options. As you see, we can add minus D option to change the home directory for the new user. We can add minus E to set an expired date for the created user account. Also, we can add minus m capital option to not create a home directory for the user you can use those options with any new user you are creating by user add command also we will see after a while or in our next lesson how to use the same options with the user mode command so that you can modify an existing user okay now let me clear the screen now let's check an important file that has some defaults of user setting. So let's edit uh, the login.dev file. So I will type vi slash etc slash login.dev. Now press enter. So from this file, you can modify default setting for any user you will create in the future. And I said in the future because any modification you will do here, will not affect any existing users. Okay, from this file, you can change, for example, the directory of mailbox from the mail underscore dir. And you also can control the password from the password again controls. You can change the minimum user ID and the maximum user ID. Also, you can change the minimum group id and the maximum group id also you can choose to not create a home directory by modifying this option from yes to no so we can modify some of the default setting to newly user created on the system from login.devs file 
now let's quit this file without saving anything by pressing on two dots then type q and exclamation mark now press enter now we have created a new user on the system the username is ali but we didn't set a password for user ali yet so let's set a password for user ali by typing password ali so the password command is used to set a password for a user or to modify an old password for a user any user can modify his own password using password command but only root or any user that has root privileges can set or modify password for other users as you see here we are logged in as user root so we can set a new password for user ali now press enter now type alice password i will type one two three four five six press enter and retype the password again now press enter as you see now all authentication tokens updated successfully which means that we have set password for user ali okay now let's add another user so let's type user add mustafa now press enter now we have added a new user named mustafa so let's run ls minus l as you see the system created a home directory for user mustafa in slash home and the mustafa's home directory has the same name as username mustafa so this is the home directory for user mustafa let me clear the screen and now let's see how can we delete a user from the system so let's type user del mustafa so the user del command is used to delete or remove users from linux system now press enter okay as you see i got an error message user mustafa doesn't exist so let's check what is the username i have created so i will type cat slash etc slash password and from the last line the user named mustafa not mustafa so let's type user del then the username which is Musafa. now press enter okay now we didn't get any error message because we have removed Musafa from the system but we didn't remove Musafa's home directory or mailbox let's run ls and press enter as you see Musafa's home directory is still there so what do we do to completely remove any user on the system with removing his home directory and mailbox let's type user del then minus minus help to figure out now press enter as you see we have some options that we can use with user del command here is the minus r option which remove home directory and mail spool so now let's clear the screen and let's add the user Musafa again so I will type user add Musafa now press enter as you see we have two messages that says the home directory already exists and in creating mailbox file file exists and that's because we didn't remove user Musafa completely so when we try to edit it again the system found that the home directory already exists and also the mailbox already exists now let's remove Musafa from the system so I will type user del minus r option then the username and as I mentioned before the minus r option will remove Musafa's home directory and mail now press enter now we removed Musafa and all his stuff let's verify that by running ls and press enter as you see the home directory for musafa has been removed okay now let me clear the screen now let's talk about groups let's create our first group on the system so let's type group add then sales the group add command will create a new group named sales now press enter okay now we have created a group named sales let's check the group file so i will type cat slash etc slash group now press enter as you see in the last 
line we have a new group named sales with an id 1002 okay now let me clear the screen now let's create another group but this time i want to define the group id let's type group add minus minus help and i know the option that is used with group add to define the group id but i want to show you that in linux we can use minus minus help anytime to get help and make our life easier because maybe you forget the option or maybe i forget too linux is not about memorizing everything now let's press enter okay as you see here the minus g option is used to set the group id so let's type group add then minus g then the group id number i will type 3000 then the new group i want to create the group name will be it dip so this command will create a group named it dip and it will set the it dip group id to 3000 now press enter now we have created a new group named it dip so let's type cat slash etc slash group to check the new group now press enter sorry i didn't type the cat correctly let me clear the screen and i will run the same command but this time i will type cat slash etc slash group now press enter now go to the last line as you see we have created a new group named it dip and the new group group id is 3000 okay let me clear the screen and now let's delete the it dip group by typing group del then the group name which is it dip so to delete or remove a group from the system you use the group del command now press enter and let's cat slash etc slash group and if we go down to the last line we will see that the it dip group is not there anymore because we have deleted it using the group del command and by that we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching and see you in next lesson hello and welcome to a new lesson in this lesson we will learn how to make any user run commands as root so that he can do exactly what the root user can do on the system right now i am logged in with the user ali ali can't install any package on the system because installing packages restricted to the root user let's try to install wget package from user ali so i will type yum install wget we will talk about yum in future lessons but for now let's know that yum is used to install packages on red hat now press enter as you see we got a message that says you need to be root to perform this command okay what can we do to install the wget package to install the wget package we should switch to the root user by running the su command so let's type su and press enter as we have learned before the su command is used to switch between users and when you type su or su dash you will be switched to the root user now let's type the roots password and press enter okay now we logged as user root and we can run yum install wget from the root user now imagine that you have one or more users who needs to run some commands as root do you think that it's logic to give the roots password to them so that they can switch to user root and do their stuff as root of course giving the roots password to other users is not logic and it is not secure and it may be harm because the user root can do anything on the system so if someone did something wrong with the roots password this may cost you your job okay now let us say that i want to allow user ali to install packages on the system so 
let's run vi sudo and we should run this command from root user the vi sudo command will edit sudo's file which is located in slash etc slash sorry the sudo's file located under slash etc slash sudo's file so why we edit the file using vi sudo while we can edit it using the vi editor okay the vi sudo command is the safest way to edit the file because vi sudo will validate the file syntax before saving the file and this validation is not available in other editors so if you edit the file using vi or nano and you did something wrong and saved the file you may face issues so don't edit sudo's file with any editor except vi sudo command so now let's type vi sudo and press enter now let's press on shift g to go to the last line now press i to be in the insert mode and let's add a comment here so i will add a hashtag now let's type allow user ali to install packages now let's go to a new line and let's type ali then all equal no password two dots slash bin slash rpm colon slash usr slash bin slash up to date then colon and slash usr slash bin slash yum now let's explain this line as you see here the first field indicate the username and that means that this rule will be applied on user ali second field all indicates that this rule applies to all hosts then we have no password that indicates that user Ali won't need to enter his password to install packages on the system. Finally, we define all commands that user Ali can run on the system as user root. He can use the RPM, the up to date, and yum commands. Now let's save the file. So I will switch from the insert mode to command mode by pressing on escape button. Now let's press on two dots then w q and press enter okay now let's switch to user ali and let's try to install a package and see what will happen so let's type su ali now press enter now to run any command as root type sudo then the command so i will type sudo yum install wget now press enter Okay, it seems that my network card is not up, so I will connect it to the internet. Okay, now let me clear the screen. Okay, now I am connected to the internet, so let's run sudo yum install wget and press enter. Okay, now let's type y to install the wget package. Now press enter. Okay, now as you see, user Ali managed to install a package on the system because we allowed Ali to install packages from suders now let me clear the screen now let's check the log access for sudo all commands that executed using sudo are logged to slash var slash log slash secure and this is one of the sudo benefits and to view uh, this log file we must switch to user root because user Ali has no permission on this file. So let's switch to user root. Now let's type e grip, then sudo, then the path to secure log file. I will type slash var slash log slash secure. The e grip command will search for sudo inside the secure file then we'll extract all lines that have sudo for me and display it on our screen now press enter okay as you see from the secure log file we can see that user ali has run the sudo command and he was trying to install 
w get now let's go back to user ali so i will type su ali and let me clear the screen now let's try to reboot the system from user ali so let's type sudo reboot now press enter the system is asking for ali's password so i will type the password for user ali okay as you see user ali is not allowed to execute slash spin slash reboot as root and that's because we didn't allow ali to reboot the system from the suders file now let us see how can we add a user to a group that can run all commands and act as a root let's switch to root user let me clear the screen now let's type user mod minus a g capital wheel m torque the user mode command is used to modify an existing account on the system we will talk about user mode in details in our next lesson but for now what we are doing is that we append the user m torque to a group named wheel the wheel group is an administrator group so anyone added to the wheel group can run commands as a root now press enter okay now we have added mtorque to wheel group let's verify that by running id mtorque and press enter as you see now mtorque is member in two groups the primary group mtorque and a supplementary group wheel now let's switch to mtorque so i will type su mtorque and press enter now i am logged in with mtork so let's reboot the system from mtork account so let's type sudo reboot press enter and type the password for mtork now press enter as you see the system is rebooting and mtork managed to reboot the system because he is a member in the wheel group and as we said that wheel group is an administration group by that we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching and see you in next lesson hello and welcome to a new lesson in this lesson we will learn how to modify an existing user or group also we will learn how to control users passwords aging using the password command okay first let's start with user mod command user mod is used to modify user account let us say that an employee left the company and i want to log his account so let's type sudo user mod then minus l capital option to lock the account then the username i will type ali for example so this command will lock ali's account now press enter okay now the system is asking for mtork password because the user mtork is using the sudo command so let's type the password for mtork and press enter okay now we have logged ali's account so let's try to switch to user ali type su dash ali then press enter now type ali's password and press enter as you see we got authentication failure because we have logged user ali okay now let's unlock ali's account so let's type sudo user mod then minus u capital to unlock the account then the username ali now press enter now let's try to switch to ali su dash then ali now type the password for user ali and press enter as you see this time we managed to switch to user ali because his account is active right now let me clear the screen okay now let's add a new group to the system but first let me switch back to user mtork so i will type su dash mtork then press enter now i will type the password for user mtork and let's add a new group named marketing to the system so i will type sudo group add then the group name as you know the group add command is used to add a new group 
so we are adding a new group named marketing now press enter now let's check the group in group file so i will type get etc then group now press enter as you see in the last line the group marketing has been added and the group id for marketing is 1004 now let's add another group so i will type sudo group add minus r then the group name apps okay this time i have added the minus r option to create a system group using a group id from the range of system group id which is defined in login.devs file now press enter now let's cat slash etc slash group okay as you see from the last line here the system group has been added and it has the group id 982 now let's edit login.devs file to check the system group id range so i will type sudo vi slash etc slash login.devs now press enter okay let's go down okay as you see here in system accounts which under uh, the group add section the system group id minimum is 201 and the system group id maximum is 999 so when we create a system group using group add minus r the system will choose an id to the group id from 201 to 999 now let's quit this file and let me clear the screen okay now let's rename the marketing group so let's type sudo group mod then minus n sales marketing so the group mod command is used to modify an existing group the minus n option is used to rename a group then we type the new group name then the old group name so this command will rename the marketing group to be sales now press enter now let's get it see group as you see now we have a group named sales and its group id is 1004 now let us see how can we change the group id for sales group first let me clear the screen then let's type sudo group mod minus g5000 then the group name sales the minus g option is used to set a new group id for a group so here we are setting 5000 as the new group id for sales group now press enter and let's get etc slash group and as you see here from the last line the new group id is 5000 now let us see how can we change the primary group for any user on the system first let's display information about user ali so let's type id ali okay as you see the primary group for user ali is ali now let's change the primary group for user ali to be sales so let's type user mod minus g small then the new primary group which will be sales and the username which is ali so this command will set group sales to be the primary group of user ali now press enter sorry i have to add sudo here before the command now press enter now let's id ali and as you see the new primary group for user ali is sales now let's add a new group so i will type sudo group add it dip and press enter now let's add ali to the new group it dip as a supplementary group 
so let's type sudo user mod minus g capital then the group name it dip then the username ali so the minus g capital here will add ali to a supplementary group named it dip now press enter now let's id ali as you see now user ali is member in two groups sales as a primary group and it dip as a supplementary group okay now let's append a new supplementary group to user ali so let's type sudo user mod minus a g capital then the new supplementary group which is apps then the username ali okay what is the difference between minus g and minus a g the minus a g is used if you are appending a new group to a user without removing him from other groups so if we removed the a option from this command that will add apps as a supplementary group but it will remove the it dip group from the supplementary group so if you want to add user to more than one supplementary group don't forget to add the a option to the g capital option now press enter now let's id ali as you see now the user ali is a member in one primary group which is sales also he is a member in two supplementary groups which are apps and it dip let me clear the screen and now let's talk about managing users password and in which location the system stores users password i have mentioned before that passwords stored in a file named shadow and this file is in slash etc slash shadow so let's print the last line from this file let's type tail minus n one slash etc slash shadow now press enter and of course i got a permission denied because i forgot to add sudo now press enter okay as you see each line in the shadow file has nine colon separated fields the first field is for username as we see here username is moh torque the second field for the encrypted password and you can know from the number six here that this password use sha 512 algorithm to hash the password if this number was five then the system is using the sha 256 algorithm and of course you can change the algorithm from login.defs file also if you found an exclamation mark at the start of the password then you should know that this password is locked now let's go to the third field which tells us the date of the last password change this field tells you when the password changed this number represents the number of days since 1 january 1970. now to the fourth field which indicates the minimum number of days before a password may be changed number zero here means no minimum age requirements to change the password the fifth field indicates the maximum number of days before a password must be changed this number means 273 years i think the user would be in other life in year 2020 89 so this number means no maximum age requirements and we will check how to modify the minimum and maximum number of days after a while now to the field number six which tell you the warning period that a password is about to expire as you see here it's seven days so if you set an expired date for muhtork password then the system will warn muhtork that his password will expire within seven days now let's go to the field number seven the number of days an account remains active after a password has expired 
so the user can log to the system during this period and change his password but if he didn't change his password his account will be inactive after the specified number of days in the saves field now let's check the eights field which indicates the account expiration date and this number represented as the number of days since 1 January 1970. The ninth field is blank and it is reserved for future use. Okay now let's list the aging information about any user on the system so we will use change command and to list the aging information about user Ali let's type sudo then change then minus L Ali now press enter now because I am using sudo from user mtorque let's type the password for user mtorque and now as you see the last password change was in 7 May 2016 password expires never password inactive never account expires never the minimum number of days between password change zero maximum number of days between password change 1990,999 number of days of warning before password expires seven days okay now let me clear the screen and let us say that I want user Ali to change his password immediately. So let's type change sudo change minus d zero Ali. So the minus d zero will force Ali to change his password when he log in to the system. Now press enter and let's switch to user Ali. Type su dash Ali and press enter. Now I will type Ali's password okay as you see you are required to change your password immediately root enforced so user Ali must change his password now let's type the current password and let's type the new password and let's retype the new password again okay now let's switch back to mtork user so I will type su dash mtork and I will type the password for user mtork let me clear the screen now let us see how can I change the password policy for user Ali to require a new password every 90 days so we need to change the maximum number of days between password change so let's type sudo change minus m capital then 90 then the username Ali now press enter and let's list information about password aging for user Ali so I will type sudo change minus L Ali now press enter now as you see the maximum number of days between password change has been changed to 90 days okay now let's change the minimum number of days between password change so I will type sudo change minus M small three Ali now press enter and let's list the aging information so as you see here the minimum number of days between password change is three days okay now if user Ali changed his password and he tried to change it again within three days the system won't accept that and he will get a message that tells him to wait longer to change his password let us see that by switching to user Ali so I will type su dash Ali then press enter now let's type Ali's password let me clear the screen and let's try to change Ali's password so I will type password then I will press enter the system is asking for my current password as you see Ali got a notification that you must wait longer to change your password so Ali can't change his password except after three days now let's switch back to user mtork
Now let us see how can we set an expired date to an account on the system. Let us say that I want user Ali account to be expired after 120 days. First, let's run date minus D, then two quotations, and between the quotations, type plus 120 days. So this command will print the date after 120 days from now. Now let's press enter. As you see, the date will be 7 September 216. Okay, now let us set an expert date on user Ali account. So let's type sudo change minus E capital. Then the date, I will start with the year, then the month, which is September, then the day, seven, then the username, Ali. Now press enter. Now let's run sudo change minus L Ali to list information about Ali's account aging. Now press enter. And as you see, the account expires in 7 September 2016. By that we get to the end of our lesson. Thank you for watching and see you in next lesson. Hello and welcome to a new lesson. We will learn about how to set permissions on files and directories. And we will see how files permission is important to secure the Linux environment. Permissions specify what a user may or may not do with files and directories. Of course you want to secure your Linux environment and you don't want any user to be changing your files or the system files. And for that purpose, we set permission in Linux. Now let's run ls-l to list files permissions. As you see, the ls-l shows detailed information about each file or directory. Now let's check the first field of the shown result. As you see, those characters represent the file or directory permission. Actually, we call them bits. If we count those bits, we will find that there are 10 bits. The first bit here indicates if this is a file, directory, or a sim link. As you see, the first bit here is D, which means that desktop is a directory. If you found the first bit is dash, that means that this is a file and if you found the first bit is l then this is a sim link so the pick here is a shortcut or a sim link to pictures directory and we will talk about sim link in details in our future lessons okay now let's go to the other nine bits and let's group those nine bits to three groups and each group has three bits. So the first three bits is for the owner of the file. The owner is usually the one that created the file, but ownership may be granted to someone else by certain users. Second three bits for the group. Every file in Linux belongs to a single group. The last three bits for others. Others means anyone else on the system that is not the owner or in the group that the file or directory belongs to. Okay, now let's explain what those characters means and let us explain the permission for the owner, the group and others on desktop directory. We said that the first three bits for the owner. We can see here that the desktops owner is mtorque and the desktop directory belongs to mtorque group okay now let's back to the first three bits which are represented by r w x the r here means that the owner can read w means that he can write and x means that he can execute so the owner of desktop directory has full permission here he can read write and execute now let's go to the second three bits which are the set permission on the group so the group here can read but it can't write because the bit for write is represented by dash finally let's go to the last three bits as you see here the last three bits for others and as you see others 
can read and they can't write and they can execute. Okay, what is read, write and execute in files permission? Read means that the one who has the read permission can read file content or he can see what inside a directory. The write permission means that you can write inside a file or you can create files and directories inside a directory. The execute is used with directories and executable files. Execute with a directory means that you can open this directory. Execute with a file means that you can execute this file and most executable files are scripts such as shell script. Now let us see files permission in action. But first let's switch to root user. Now let's go to home directory and let's create a new directory make dire sales now press enter now let's create another directory make dire sales marketing now press enter right now i have created sales directory under the home directory and inside sales directory i have created marketing directory now let's run ls minus l okay as you see the owner and the group of sales directory is user root and group root now let's check the permission on the directory as you see the permissions are read write execute for the owner of sales directory and we can know the owner from here so the owner of sales directory is user root the group root has read and execute permissions and anyone else on the system has the read and execute permission Okay, now I want to change the group of sales directory to be sales group. To change the owner or the group of file or directory, we use the chown command. The full syntax for chown command is chown user two dots group, then the path to file or directory. So if we are going to change the owner and the group at the same time, I will type chown user two dots group, then the file or directory path. If I want to change the owner only, I will type chown the new owner. In our case, I want to change the group, so I will type chown two dots sales, which is the name of the new group and the directory sales now press enter now let's run ls minus l as you see now the sales directory belongs to sales group and from the group permission we can see that the group has the right and execute permission the group permission means that any user who is a member in sales group can read and execute okay now let's add a user to sales group and check what he can do let's type user mod minus ag then the name of the group then the username so this command will add user mtorque to sales group now press enter and let's type id mtorque as you see now mtorque is member in sales group now let me clear the screen now let's switch to user mtorque so i will type su dash mtorque now let's go to the home directory so i will type cd slash home and let's run ls minus l okay now mtorque is a member in sales group and from the sales directory permission we can see that any member in sales group can read what inside the directory and he can execute the directory so let's type cd sales as you see, user mtorque, who is a member in sales group, managed to execute the directory. Now let's check if mtorque can list files and directories inside sales. So let's run ls-l. As you see, mtorque managed to read what inside the sales directory. Now let's try to create a file inside sales directory. So let's run touch file. Now press enter. As you see, mtorque can't create a file inside sales directory and that's because sales group has no right permission on sales directory and since mtorque is a member in sales group then mtorque inherit his permission from sales group so 
mTurk also has no write permission on sales directory. Now, let us see how can we set permission on files and directories. We can set permission using octal notation or symbolic notation. In this lesson, we will start with the octal notation or numbers. Each permission in Linux has a number. So, read permission equal to 4. Write permission equal to 2. Finally, the execute permission equal to 1. Remember those numbers because it will help you to set the right permission. Let us see how. Let's go back to home directory and let me clear the screen. Now let's run ls minus l. Okay, now our scenario is to give write permission to sales group. So let's type chmod. chmod is used to modify permissions on Linux. After the chmod command, we will set permissions on owner group and other using numbers. So let's set the owner permission. I want the owner to read. And as we know, read equal 4. Also, I want the owner to write and as you see write permission equal to 2 and I want the owner to execute and as you see execute equal to 1 so to have the read write and execute permission I will add the numbers here so it will be read 4 plus 2 for write plus 1 for execute this equal to 7 so the command will be chmod7 and 7 here is the addition of the first three bits together now to the group permission as you see we have read and execute permission so the right permission for group is read which is number four plus execute which is number one so the current permission on sales directory equal to five but I want the group to have read, write, and execute. So the read is 4, write equal 2, so I will type plus 2, then execute equal 1, so I will type plus 1. So the addition of 4 plus 2 plus 1 equal to 7. So now the command will be chmod 7, 7, and as we said, the first number here represents the owner the second number here represents the group now let's go to the last three bits which represent the other permission and i want the other permission to be read so the read will be four then i don't want the other to have the right permission then the right permission will be zero finally i want others to execute the directory so i will add number one for the execute so the addition of four plus zero plus one equal to five so the command will be chmod seven seven five now type the directory or file name i will type sales now let's press enter sorry i have to type sudo here now press enter now let's type mtorc password now let's ls minus l okay now let's check sales directory permissions from uh, those permissions i can know that the owner of sales directory can read write and execute also the sales group can read write and execute finally others can read they can't write and they can execute okay we have seen before modifying the group permission that mtorc didn't manage to create a file inside the sales directory now let's verify that mtorc as a member in sales group he can write inside sales directory and writing inside a directory means that mtorc can create files directories and also he can edit and delete files now let's go to sales directory let me clear the screen now let's run touch file.txt 
now press enter okay it seems that mtorque has created the file so let's ls minus l okay as you see mtorque managed to create a file named file.txt but if you noticed here the file owner is mtorque and the file belongs to mtorque group we will see when we talk about symbol notations and set user id and set group id how can we force permissions on a directory so that any user belongs to sales group create files here the files will automatically set to group sales for now let us see how can we create files from user mtorque and set the group of those files to sales group so let's type new group then the group name now press enter now let's create a new file so i will type touch new file now press enter and let's run ls minus l as you see the ne file has been created and it is belong to group sales by that we get to the end of this lesson thank you for watching and see you in next lesson hello and welcome to a new lesson in this lesson we will learn how to monitor our system using the top command using top we can see running processes and much more details in real time about our system but before talking about top let's run the uptime command so let's type uptime and press enter the uptime shows us some information about this system if we look here we can know that this machine is running up from 11 minutes and we have two logged users on this machine the uptime command also shows you the load average on the machine as you see here we have three load averages the first number here is the average for the last one minute the second number here is the average or the load average for the last five minutes finally the third number here is the load average for the last 15 minutes okay now let's check how can we calculate the load on the server let's run cat slash proc slash cpu info as you see the cpu info has information about the machine processor such as the processor model name okay now how can we know how much processors we have on this machine so let's check how to know the total number of processors that we have type the same command cat slash proc slash cpu info then pipe the output to grep to search for processors then pipe the output to wc minus l sorry this word must be processor not processors so this command will extract the word processor from the cpu info file then it will count the number of processor occurrence inside the cpu info finally the shown number from this command is going to be the number of processors that you have now let's press enter as you see this machine has four processors so to calculate the load on this server we will divide the average by the number of processors okay now let's run a command to uh, increase the load on the server so let's type yes then redirect the command to slash dev slash null and type the end sign to run this command in the background okay now let's run the uptime command as you see now the average load increased let's run the yes command again now let's run uptime one more time and as you see now the average load increased so how can we calculate the load on the server as i said before the load calculation is depending on the number of processors so if you have one cpu this average means that you are consuming 50 percent of the available cpu in our case we have four processors so we will divide the load average by four so let's bring the calculator here and let's type this 
load average 0.52 divided by 4 equal to 0.13 so you are consuming 13 percentage of your total CPUs on the server so for now we have learned how to calculate the load average or the load on the system so let's talk about the top command but first let me kill the yes command so let's type kill yes then press enter now let's run top and press enter as we see top showing us a real-time information about our system and the running processes on the system so as you see here from the top output we can know that this machine is running up from 19 minutes we have two logged in users and the load average is one we can know that we have 438 total tasks and we have one running task and 437 sleeping tasks we have zero stop and zero zombie process we can know the total amount of memory and the free memory available and the used memory also we can know the total swap area and the free swap area and the used swap area on the machine from here we can see each process running on the system with their process id and the user and the percentage of cpu and memory for each process on the system now to know the percentage of memory we are using let's press on m as you see we are using 47 percentage of the total memory on this machine now press on m again and press on m one more time as you see now the memory information has been gone to bring it back press on m okay now let's check how can we know how many processors this machine have let's press on number one as you see this machine have four processors now press on one again to hide the total cpus now to quit the top command press on ctrl c let's run this command and redirect it to slash dev slash null to make some load on the server now type top and press enter and as you see here the average load is increasing on the system now let's press on t and as you see now we can see the cpu's utilization from here you can see the cpu utilization and if we pressed on one we can see the utilization of each cpu on the system so from here we can know that we are using 99 percentage of cpu one now let's press on one again okay now let's check how can we sort the output according to the memory usage so let's press on shift plus m okay as you see now we have sorted the output according to the memory usage now to sort the running process by cpu utilization press on shift plus p and as you see now the output has been sorted by the cpu utilization okay as you see top is a great tool and you will spend a lot of time in front of it to discover processes that is consuming your cpu or memory now let's check how can we kill a process from top okay as you see here from this output we can see that his command is consuming 100 percent of cpu and to kill this process press on k then type the process id for various process here is the process id so i will type 3998 now press enter now type the signal you want to send to kill this process if you press enter here without providing any signal then default signal will be sent 
Here we can type the signal number or signal name. For example, let's type sig kill. Now press enter. Now we have killed the yes process. And as you see here, we don't have yes running process anymore. Okay, now let's check how can we sort this output according to the process ID. So let's press on shift and the R button. As you see now, we have sorted the output according to the process ID number. Okay, now let's quit the top command by pressing on Control C. Now let's check how can we specify a delay between screen updates? So let's type top, sorry, let's type top minus D, then two. This command will run the top and it will refresh each two seconds. So this output are going to be refresh each two seconds. Now press on control C and let's run top minus N. Two. This command will specify the number of frames that top should produce before ending. You can change the number to here to any number you want. Now press enter. And as you see, top has been quit after two updated frames. And by that, we get to the end of our lesson. Thank you for watching and see you in next lesson. Hello and welcome to a new lesson. We will learn together how to start, stop, and enable services using systemctl command. First, let's check shell service status. So let's type systemctl status sshd.service. From the shown result, we can know that sshd service is active and running. Now let's verify that sshd process is running using ps command so let's type ps then minus up then type the process id for sshd service as we see here the process id is 8890 now press enter as you see the sshd process is running now let's check how to stop the sshd service to stop SSHD service or any service, type system CTL, then stop. After that, type the service name. In our example, I will type SSHD.service. Okay, now let's press enter and let's verify the status of SSHD service. So I will run the command systemctl status sshd.service. Now press enter. Okay, as you see now from this output, we can know that sshd service is not running because it is inactive and dead. Okay, now let's start the service again by running systemctl, then start after the start type the service name you want to start i will type sshd.service now press enter now let's check the status of sshd.service so let's type systemctl status sshd.service now press enter as you see now, the SSHD service is active and running. Also, if you noticed, the process ID for SSHD after starting the service is different than the process ID which was before. We can reload SSHD service and the reload mean to save and apply service configuration without complete start and stop. So let's check how can we reload sshd service to reload a service on linux type system ctl then reload then the service name now press enter and let's check the sshd dot service status as you see now the service is running and also if you noticed here the process id still the same because we reloaded the service 
Usually we start services when we modify service configuration files. So after any modifications we do, we should start the service to apply the new modifications. An example for that is when we change the default shell port from 22 to let us say 3212. We cannot connect to the new port until we restart the SSHD service. Also, we can reload SSHD service, which is better than restarting the service, because as we said, reload doesn't stop and start the service. Reload apply your modifications without the need to restart the service. For now, we have seen and learned how to start, stop, and reload services. So let's move to another topic. Let's talk about unit dependencies. Some services are unit dependencies, such as the CUPS service. CUPS is a printing service on Linux. CUPS depends on CUPS.socket and CUPS.path. You can't stop CUPS.service only because if a request is made on the network socket, then the CUPS.service will start automatically. So to be sure that you stop CUPS service or any unit dependencies, you must stop all dependencies services. Now let's stop CUP service. So I will type systemctl stop CUPS.service. Now press enter. As you see the warning message, stopping CUPS to service, but it can still be activated by CUPS.path. So to be sure that the CUPS do service won't be started, let's stop CUPS do socket and CUPS do path. So you have to stop CUPS do socket, then stop CUPS do path. And I did that to be sure that CUPS do service won't be started by any other dependency. Also, you can disable the CUPS service to be sure that it won't be started automatically. And to do that, let's type systemctl disable CUPS service. Now press enter. Okay, now let's check how can we enable and disable services. And I have mentioned before that enable a service means that this service will start automatically when the system boot. Let us say that I want to enable the HTTPD service to start automatically when the system boot. First, let's check the HTTPD status. So I will type systemctl status HTTPD.service. And as we can see now that the Apache web server is running and the status is disabled. Now let's enable the HTTPD.service. So let's type systemctl enable HTTPD.service. Now press enter. Now let's check the status again. And as we can see here, now the HTTPD.service is enabled. So now HTTPD.service will start automatically when the system boot. If we want to disable a service, I will type systemctl, then disable, then the service name. I will type httpd.service, now press enter. And let's check the status again. And as you can see here, now the httpd.service is disabled. And by that we have seen together how to enable and disable services to start or not start automatically when the system boot. Now let's move to the last topic in our lesson. Let's talk about masking services. Sometimes you may have two services that can't be started together because they are conflict with each other. Let us say that you are working on Red Hat 7 which support firewall D as the firewall service, but you prefer to work on IP table firewall. So you install the IP table and stop disabled the firewall D service. For now, everything is fine. But what if another system administrator who is working with 
you started the firewall D service. If that happened, then you will have two conflict services running at same time which may cause issues on your system. So to be sure that no one can start firewall D while you are using IP tables, you will mask the firewall D service. Now let's check how can we mask a service to prevent anyone from starting it. So let's type system CTL then mask. After the mask type the service you want to mask it, I will type firewall D. Now press enter. Okay, now we have masked the firewall D. So no one can start the firewall D service. Let's verify that by running system CTL start firewall D. Now press enter. As you see, we got a message that says failed to start firewall D to service unit firewall D to service is masked. Okay, now let's check how can we unmask the firewall D. It's easy. You will type systemctl, then unmask, then the service name, which is firewall D in our example. Now press enter. And by that, we have unmasked the firewall D. Now let's try to start or restart the firewall D service. And as you see now, we managed to restart the firewall D service because we removed the mask from the firewall D dot service. By that, we get to the end of our lesson. Thank you for watching and see you in next lesson. Hello and welcome to a new lesson. We will learn how to reboot and shut down the system normally. Okay, first, let's begin our lesson with how to reboot the system. So let's type system ctl reboot but before executing this command let's check how can we reboot the system via other commands so we can run reboot to reboot the system or we can run shut down minus r now also we can run init 6 or till init so as you see we have many ways to reboot the system but it's better to stuck with one command as i am doing to do right now so let's execute system ctl reboot okay now let's press enter to reboot the system Okay, now I have rebooted the system successfully uh, with the systemctl reboot command. So let's log in. Okay, now I have logged in uh, with the user root. So let's check how can we shut down the system. To shut down a system, let's run shutdown. The shutdown is a great utility and it's very polite. When you execute shutdown, it will broadcast a message to all logged in users telling them that the system will be shut down within one minute. Also, you can schedule a shutdown. So let's check how can we do that. Now let's execute this command without any option. So let's press enter. As you see, the shutdown broadcast a message that says the system is going down for power off at then uh, the date and time. We can cancel uh, the shutdown command by running shut down minus C. And as you see here, the system shutdown has been canceled. Okay, now let's check how can we schedule uh, the shutdown. First, let's run date now let's now let's schedule the system to shut down at 17 20 so to do that i will run shut down then minus h and i will provide the shutdown command with the hour so let's type 17 20 so by executing this command the system will broadcast a message that it will uh, power off the system at 1720.
now let's press enter and as you see here the system is going down for power off at Sunday 27 of November 2016 at uh, 1720 also we can cancel uh, this command by running shutdown minus C okay now let's check uh, how can we shut down the system immediately without warning any logged in user so to shut down the system immediately we will run shutdown then minus H then now now let's press enter as you see the system has been powered off immediately okay now we have seen how to uh, shut down the system using the shutdown command also we can use many ways to shut down a system we can run one of uh, those commands we can run halt or system system ctl sorry system ctl halt uh, halt here will bring the system to a state that you can safely manually power off the machine also we can run init zero to shut down the system or we can run till init zero to uh, shut down the system too uh, but as i said before it's better to stuck with one command so we will stuck with the shutdown command now let's check how to power off the system and power off is like shutdown but power off uh, is used to uh, shut down the system immediately so to power off a system you can run system ctl power off or you can run power off directly the power off command will power off the system immediately as shutdown minus h now command do and by that we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching and see you in next lesson Hello to a new lesson, we will cover creating, mounting and unmounting VFAT, EXT4 and XFS file system. So let's start the lesson by listing all hard disks that attach it to this system. So let's run if disk minus L and here is all hard disks that attach it to this system we have sdb and from sdb we have sdb1 also we have sdc hard disk and from sdc we have a partition sdc1 so let's uh, format sdb first and please don't uh, do what you will see in a production server unless you know exactly what are you doing so let's format sdb with parted utility so let's run parted slash dev slash sdb okay we can use parted to create partitions from hard disk but i prefer to work uh, with f disk and g disk when i manage hard disks and when i do uh, something vicious with the hard disk i use g parted now let's type help to get a list with all g parted command here we have rm command to delete partition number also we have print to display the partition table the available uh, devices free space and so on now let's run print as you see on sdb we have only uh, one partition so let's delete this partition by typing rm then the partition number now let's type uh, print to verify that we have deleted this partition as you see now we don't have any partition created from sdb hard disk okay now let's quit g parted and as you see we have deleted sdb's partitions so let's create a new partition from sdb by running fdesk dev sdb to create a new partition type n 
this will be a primary partition so I will type P the partition number will be the default the first sector will be the default also I will leave the last sector to the default because I want to use the entire hard disk now press enter now to save and quit if disk utility type W okay now we have created a partition from SDB our new partition will be SDB1 so let's make a VFAT file system on SDB1 VFAT is the Windows file system and you may need to create a VFAT file system on a Linux partition so that Windows users can share their files uh, in the VFAT partition now to make VFAT file system on SDB1 let's run MKFS then minus T the file system type VFAT then the partition that we will create VFAT on now press enter okay now let's create a directory to mount vfat file system to it so let's run mkdir dash vfat and let's mount dev sdb1 to vfat directory and to verify that we successfully mounted sdb1 let's run the f minus h and as you see here we have mounted sdb1 to the fat directory now we can create files inside vfat so let's create file 1 and file 2 okay now let's make our mounting persistent so let's edit fs tab file press i to be in the insert mode and go to the last line now uh, type the device pass then the mounted point which is vfat directory then uh, the file system vfat then defaults then one to dump flag and two for uh, checking the file system now let's save and quit fstep file and as you know to mount all devices inside fstab file we need to run mount minus a you may feel that we are repeating partitioning hard disks mounting partitions and editing fstab uh, yes we do and what we are doing is very good to prepare you well for the rhcsa exam because for sure you will create partitions make file system on those partitions mounting partition so we need to be sure that our work is persistent so we don't repeat uh, po uh, boring stuff we are practicing as much as we can to get ready for the exam okay now let's run fdisk on sdc let's create a new partition this partition will be primary so i will type p the partition number will be one i will leave the first sector and here i want to create a five gigabytes partition so i will type plus 5g now let's type w to save and exit now let's make a ext4 file system on sdc1 to make a file system i will type mkfs then minus t and our file system will be ext4 then the path to the partition okay now we have created our ext file system on sdc1 now let's create a new directory xt4 and let's mount uh, our sdc1 partition to ext4 directory now let's run df minus h and as you see now we mounted sdc1 to ext4 
Okay, now let's edit FS tab file. So let's run VI, etc, FS tab, and let's add div SDC1, then the mount directory, root ext4, the file system ext4, defaults 1, 2. Now save the file and run mount minus a to uh, read the fs tab file and mount all devices inside the file now let us see how can uh, we check and repair a linux file system with fsck utility to check a vfat file system we will run fsck or file system check dot vfat then the path to the vfat partition but before executing the command we need to unmount the file system first so let's do u mount vfat now let's run fsck dot vfat on dev is the p1 of course uh, fsck may take some time in a real environment and a possible exit code should appear let's do man fsck and as you see here this is a manual page for fsck command if we go down here we can know the exit code returned by fsck okay now let's quit the manual page now let's check the file system which we have created on sdc1 and if you remember the file system on sdc1 is ext4 so before run fsck on sdc1 we need to unmount sdc1 so let's run unmount sorry u mount ext4 now if we run df minus h as you see we amount sdc1 successfully okay now let's run fsck dev sdc1 and as i said uh, this command will take more time in a real environment so let's review again to check file system on vfat we run fsck dot vfat and if we want to check ext4 file system we will run fsck command now let's check how to know information about the file system with dump to fs command so let's do dump to fs then dev sdc1 of course you can uh, change sdc1 to another partition and as you see we got information about sdc1 the file system volume name last mounted on the uid the inode count and the block count and so on now after we have learned about vfat and ext4 let's move on and learn how to check and repair xfs file system and how to get info about xfs file system so first let's create another partition on sdc type in to create a new partition this will be a primary partition the partition number is the default the first sector is the default i will create a 5 gigabytes partition so i will type plus 5g now save and exit and let's make xfs file system on sdc2 so let's run mkfs then minus t then the file system type xfs then the pass to the partition sdc2 now let's create a directory and let's mount sdc2 to xfs directory 
it's run df minus h and as you see now sdc2 is mounted to xfs point now to get information about xfs file system we will use xfs underscore info then the path to our xfs partition and as you see xfs underscore info listed information about sdc2 file system okay now let's check how can we uh, check and repair xfs file system and as we agreed first we need to unmount the file system that we are going to check and repair so let's run unmount xfs to unmount xfs file system then to repair uh, and check xfs file system we will use xfs underscore repair then the path to xfs partition now press enter and by running xfs underscore repair we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching and see you in next lesson hello and welcome to a new lesson in this lesson we will cover acl or access control list access control list gives you the ability to add more flexible permission mechanism for file system acl enabled by default in ext4 and xfs file system so let's start our lesson and let's create couple of users and a group to see acl in action i will add user ali to the system also i will add user mustafa and i will add a group sales then i will add user ali to sales group okay now let's move to data directory and let's create sales directory now before setting any acl let's get file access control list for sales directory so let's run get facl then the directory name which is sales so each time you need to display the access control list for a file or a directory you will run get facl command following it with the directory or file path and because we are in the same path as sales directory so i typed the name of the directory without the full path and as shown in the get facl output we can know the acl for sales directory and from this acl we can know that the owner of sales is user root and that sales directory belongs to group root also we can know the permissions of the owner the group and the others here the owner has read write and execute permission the group has read and execute permissions any other user on the system has read and execute permission and as a quick refreshment execute permission for directories means open or browsing that directory the execute permissions for a file means that this file is executable and for sure the executable files are uh, usually scripts that do some operations on the system now let's create a file inside sales directory so i will type touch sales and invoice dot txt now let's get the acl4 invoice dot txt by running get facl command then the path to the file and as you see from the shown output i can know uh, that the owner of invoice can read and write inside the file both uh, group and any one else on the system can read the file okay now let us say that i need to give user ali the ability to edit invoice.txt file edit here means read and write permissions so the logic 
thinking is to use what we have learned before in files permissions lessons. So we can make Ali the owner of invoice.txt file so that he can read and write permissions or we can modify the group of invoice.txt file to be sales group. After that, we modify the group permissions to be read and write. Finally, we add user Ali to sales group and by doing that, user Ali will get the read and write permissions. Okay, I can do all that without ACL. But guess what? I don't want to modify the owner of invoice.txt, neither the group that invoice.txt file belongs to, and I still want to give Ali the ability to read and edit invoice.txt file. So you think now that I'm crazy, right? But guess what? I'm not. Because I can do uh, it with ACL. So let's do it. Now to set ACL on files or directories, we will use set FACL command. So we have two commands to deal with ACL. The first command is get FACL to get ACL and set FACL to set ACL. Okay, now let's run set FACL. I want to modify ACL, so I will add minus M option. And to set ACL for user, type U, then two dots. And in our case, we need to set ACL for Ali, so let's type Ali as the user. Now I want to give Ali read and write permissions, so let's type two dots, then the permission read write finally type the path to the directory or file you need to set acl on in our case i will set acl on invoice.txt which is under sales directory now let's do get facl on invoice.txt file as you see in the shown output now we have a new line here for user Ali. And from this line we can know that Ali has read and write permission on invoice.txt file. Okay, let's verify that. I will switch to user Ali. Then I will go to sales and I will edit the file invoice.txt. I will press I to be in the insert mode and I will type hi from Ali. Now let's save the file and let's get invoice.txt. And as you see, Ali managed to uh, edit invoice.txt after we set ACL for Ali on invoice.txt file. Okay, now let's run ls minus ld invoice.txt. And as you see in the end of permissions, we have plus here. Plus means that this file has a CL. Okay, now let's exit from user Ali. Now let's set ACL for user Mustafa on sales directory. To set ACL, I will use set FACL command, then minus M, then the user Mustafa, and I want to give Mustafa read, write, and execute permission on sales directory. Now let's run get FACL command on sales directory. And now as you see, user Mustafa has a the read, write and execute permission on sales directory. Okay, now let's edit invoice.txt with user Mustafa. So I will switch to user Mustafa. And let's go inside sales directory. Let's 
edit invoice.txt now let's press i to be in the insert mode as you see here warning changing a read only file so it seems that mustafa can't edit invoice.txt file we already set acl on sales directory to user mustafa and we gives uh, mustafa the ability to read write and execute yes we did that but we set acl for user mustafa on sales directory only and all files and directories inside sales don't inherit permissions by default from their parent directory so we should enable inheritance by default for user mustafa to allow him to uh, edit files inside sales directory so let's quit this file without saving and let's switch back to the root user now let's run set facl minus m and to inherit permissions we will type d then u then mustafa as the user then the permissions read write execute and we will run this command on sales directory okay now let's create a new file inside sales directory this file will be invoice2.txt now let's edit invoice2.txt from user mustafa now let's edit invoice2.txt hi from mustafa and as you see now we didn't get any warning message because we inherited the acl for user uh, mustafa okay now let's save this file and let's get invoice2.txt as you see user mustafa successfully edited uh, invoice2.txt file okay now uh, we are logged in as user mustafa so let's try to edit invoice.txt file now let's press i as you see we uh, got a warning message changing a read only file so as you see we can't edit invoice.txt file from user mustafa and that's because we set acl for user mustafa on the newly created files and directories so user mustafa can't edit all files that was created before setting acl so how can we manage to work around this and be sure that user mustafa can edit all the created files so let's check how can we do that i will exit this file without saving and i will switch back to root now let's run set facl minus r to modify the acl recursively on a directory also i will add minus m option then you and mustafa as the user then our permission read write execute on sales directory okay now let's switch to uh, user mustafa and let's try to edit invoice.txt file again okay now let's press enter as you see now we are in the insert mode without any warning message let's modify this to be and mustafa now let's save the file and let's get invoice.txt file as you see hi from ali and mustafa 
and by that the SEL for user Mustafa inherited from the parent directory to all files and subdirectories inside the parent directory. The parent directory here is sales directory. Now let's check how uh, can we set SEL for group sales. I will exit from user Mustafa and to set SEL for a group I will run set FACL then minus R to set SEL recursively on a directory and minus M and to set SEL for group I will type G then two dots the group name then two dots the permissions read write then the path or the name of the directory that I want to set SEL on. Our directory is sales. Now let's get the SEL for uh, sales directory. So let's run get if SEL sales and press enter. As you see now, we have a new line for group sales and the permissions for sales group or read and write permission okay now let's check how can we copy SEL from file to another file so let's create a new file inside sales directory this file will be file1.txt let's get FACL for this file Also, let's get SEL for invoice.txt file. So, the SEL for file1.txt uh, is that the user can read and write, user Mustafa can read, write, and execute, the group can read and execute, and any other user on the system can read only. Now, let's take a look on invoice.txt SEL as we see here the difference between SEL for invoice.txt and SEL for file1.txt is that SEL uh, on invoice.txt file has SEL for group sales so now I want to copy the SEL from invoice.txt to file1.txt Let's check how can we do that. I will run get FACL to get the SEL on invoice invoice.txt. Then I will pipe this command to set FACL command. Then the option minus minus set dash file equal dash file file one dot txt so this command will copy acl from invoice dot txt file to file one dot txt let's press enter now let's get facl on file one dot txt to verify that we copied the SEL from invoice.txt to file1.txt and as you see here we copied the group SEL for sales group to be read and write ok finally when you work with SEL don't modify the permissions with ch mod on any files directories that you set acl on because this may ruin your acl and by that we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching and see you in next lesson hello and welcome to a new lesson in this lesson we will learn how to modify the linux machine's host name and how to configure the name resolution first let's check how can we know the current host name so here we are uh, on a Linux machine and to know the host name of this machine let's run 
post name now press enter from the shown result we can know that the host name of this machine is server a.exam.com okay now let's check how to modify the host name on this Linux machine we will use uh, host name ctl command to set or modify the host name of this machine so let's run host name ctl then to set a host name let's type set host name after that type the new host name for this machine i will type server b dot zom dot com so this command will modify the host name of this machine to be server b dot exam dot com now let's press enter okay now the host name has been changed to be server b dot example dot com but as you see here we still see server a as the host name so let's close this terminal and let's open a new one to verify our modification and as you see now uh, we have server b as the host name also we can verify that we have successfully modified the host name to be server b from the host name configuration file so let's display the content of host name configuration file so let's run cat slash etc slash host name as you see from the shown result the new host name is server b.example.com also we can run host name to verify the host name of this machine now let's press enter and as you see the new host name is server b.example.com we have uh, several ways to uh, check or verify the host name of linux machine so we can use the hostname ctl command to check some information about this machine including the hostname so let's run hostname ctl then status now press enter and as you see from the shown result the static hostname is serverb.example.com okay now let's talk about hosts file and name resolution we have seen and edited hosts file before in one of our previous lessons when you try to resolve a host name to an ip the first thing that will be done by linux is to look at hosts file to check if it stores an ip for the host name you want to resolve or not if there is an answer inside hosts file then the system will re replay with the host ip but if there is nothing inside hosts file related to the host name you want to resolve its ip then the system will ask the dns which is configured in resolve.conf file and get an answer from the dns also some tools such as dig and ns lookup deal with resolve.conf as their first choice to get an ip of a host name okay now let's check the hosts file so let's run vi slash etc slash hosts now press enter and as you see here uh, we have defined an ip for remote server we did this in one of our previous lessons now let's define an ip to mail.example.com host so first i will press on i to be in the insert mode now let's type the ip of mail.example.com the ip is 192.168.1.103 after the ip type the host name mail.example.com and by that when the system is looking for mail.example.com it will get the ip from hosts file so the system will find that the ip of mail.example.com is 192.168.1.103 also we can add an alias to mail.example.com so let's take a space and let's type 
mail. So now we can reach 192.168.1.103 by the hostname mail.example.com or the alias mail. Okay, now let's save the file. Now let's verify that mail.example.com has the IP that we configured. So let's ping minus C3 mail.example.com. Now press enter. And as you see, the result is uh, the IP that we have defined in hostess file. Okay, now let's ping mail.example.com by its alias. So I will run ping minus C3, then the alias mail. Now press enter. And as you see, we get the same IP. So now anyone using this machine can reach 192.168.1.103 by mail.example.com or by the alias mail only. Okay, now we have learned what is the purpose of hostess file. And we have said that if the system didn't find an answer about the host IP inside the hostess file, then the system will look for the answer from the DNS name server. The DNS is configured inside resolve.conf. So let's run cat etc resolve.conf. As you see, the name server here is 192.168.1.1. So when I try to browse google.com, for example, the system will check if google.com IP is stored inside hostess file. And for sure, it will not find Google's IP there. So the system will ask the DNS, which is configured inside resolve.conf. And in this case, our DNS is 192.168.1.1. Then the system will get an answer about what's Google's IP from this name server. Okay, if you remember, we have seen together how to add DNS using an MCLI command in the configuring network using an MCLI lesson. Uh, but let's check again how can we add DNS or name server to our connection and when we add DNS to our connection the network manager will update resolve.com file with the new DNS which we added to the connection. Okay now let's run an MCLI con mod then the connection name which is default after that type IP version 4.dns then type the DNS I will use the public DNS of Google so this command will add the public Google DNS to the default connection now let's press enter now to apply our modifications let's deactivate the connection then activate it again to deactivate the connection, I will run an MCLI, con down, then the connection name, which is default. As you see, connection default successfully deactivated. Now let's activate the connection. So I will run the same command, but this time I will type up. So to activate a connection, you will run nmcli con up then the name of the connection. Now let's press enter. As you see, connection successfully activated. Okay, now let's verify that the new DNS has been added to resolve.conf. So let's run cat etc resolve. And as you see, we have added the name server 8.8.8.8 to resolve.com and by that we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching and see you in hello and welcome to a new lesson in this lesson we will learn how to use yum tool to install remove update and query software packages 
Yum was developed by Red Hat to make our life as system admins easier. When you run Yum to install a software, the Yum will search for the software in the repositories which added to the system. When Yum finds the software you need to install in a repo, then Yum will download the software and if the software depends on other softwares, Yum will download all dependencies packages and install your software with all dependencies okay let us see yum in action okay now let's check installed and available packages so let's run yum list now press enter okay as you see the yum list shows us the installed and available packages and it seems that they are huge number let's let's check how many packages by running the same command again but this time i will pipe to wc minus l to count the number of outputs as you see we have 20385 installed and available packages okay now i want to list packages that are related to httpd package httpd is the apache web server so let's run yum list then http asterisk so this command will list all packages that has HTTP in their names. So Linux will search for HTTP whatever the characters coming after the P letter. Okay, now let's press enter. Okay, as you see, we have installed package here that has HTTP in the package name. And also from the yum list command, we can know that we have available packages under available packages and all those packages related to HTTP. Okay, now let us say that I don't know that there is a web server called Apache Web Server. And also I don't know that the package name of Apache Web Server is HTTPD. So I want to search for all potential web server packages using yum. So let's run yum search. Then let's type between quotations web server. Okay, now let's press enter. And as you see here in the shown output I got a result with some packages but if I look down here the system is telling me that uh, this is the result for name and summary matches only and if I want to get more result I should use search all to uh, search for everything so let's type yum search all then between quotations web server now press enter okay this time I got more result I can read the description of each package and I can know exactly what I suppose to install okay as you see here I have a package called engine X and the description is telling me that this is a high performance web server and reverse proxy server. Let's go down. And here I can see that httpd package is Apache HTTP server. Okay, now let us say that I am interested in httpd package and I want to know more details about this package. So let's check how can we know more details about any package from the package name so let's run yum info httpd so the info option with yum command will display more information about 
the httpd package now let's execute the command okay as you see from the shown uh, output i can know the architecture of this package the version uh, the release and uh, a summary of the package the url or the official url for apache web server and the description of the package okay now let's check how to know the package that provides or responsible for a certain path let's type run provides then slash etc slash ssh slash ssh underscore config what i am doing here that i want to know uh, which package is responsible for sshd underscore config now let's press enter and as you see from the shown output i can know that uh, open ssh server is responsible for sshd underscore config file okay now let's do some real action using yum let's install the httpd package first let's check what is httpd so i will run yum info httpd and here from the description i can know that httpd is the apache http server okay now to install the httpd or any other package i will type yum install then i will type the package name our package name is httpd okay now let's press enter okay as you see it says that httpd package already installed and latest version okay now let's install another package let's install for example nginx package so to install a package i will type yum install engine x now let's press enter okay as you see from the shown output the system will install engine x package also it will it will install all dependencies for engine x from uh, this shown output you can know the package name the architecture of the package the version and the repository uh, that store this package now to install this package i will type y then press enter to proceed now the system is downloading packages now i have to import the gpg key so i will type y and now the system is installing nginx and all uh, dependencies packages okay now we have installed nginx package uh, successfully now let's check how can we update a package on the system to update a package just type yum update then the package name let's update httpd package okay as you see now uh, the system is telling me that no package is marked for update and that's because uh, the httpd package is up to date on the system okay now what if i want to update all packages on the system in once so to update all packages on the system run yum update and press enter and as you see from the shown output uh, a new package will be installed and a total of 222 packages will be upgraded if you want to upgrade the system type y and press enter to proceed but i'm not going to update uh, packages on the system so i will type n and press enter okay now let's uh, move to another topic in our lesson let's check how can we remove or let us say uninstall package let's remove httpd package so to remove the apache observer package run yum then remove then type the package name our package name is httpd now press enter as you see now uh, the system is telling you that package httpd will be 
erase to proceed type y and press enter now we uh, removed httpd package successfully okay for now we have seen how to install update and remove packages so let's move to another topic and let's see how can we install groups of software with yum okay first let's list groups by running yum group list or you can run the command yum group list i will use this command now press enter okay now i have list of groups now i can get info about any groups by running yum group info then the group name let's select development tools group and let's run yum info sorry yum group info then the group name development tools now let's press enter and as you see we can know from the info command that this is a basic development environment it contains gcc compiler and all related software that allows you to develop and install packages from the source now let's check how can we install the development uh, tool group so let's run yum group install then the group name development tools so to install group we will run yum group install then the group name now press enter and to proceed the installation process uh, type y but i will type no because i don't want to install this group okay as you see yum make our life as system admins much easier now let's check how can we trace yum log files and yum history to check what packages was installed or removed from our system let's run yum history and as you see yum history shows us some information about system users and uh, what did they do on the system so you can see here that user root did an action erase user mtorque install something on the system okay now i want to check the name of packages which installed or removed from the system so let's run tail slash var slash log slash yum dot log and yum dot log is the log file uh, of yum utility now let's press enter from the shown output i can know the package name and when did the package installed or removed so as we can see here the guip package installed uh, in 25 october and the httpd package erased or removed also in 25 october and by this comment we get to the end of our lesson thank you for watching hello guys and welcome to the last lesson here in the linux introduction course i guess you have reached here after watching all of the previous lessons and i would like to thank you very much for joining the course and i hope you found it in good benefit for you as i have said in the promo lesson this course is for students who would like to know about linux and they are completely new to linux okay now after we have learned some of the linux let's have a look at what we have learned during the course first of all we have seen here an overview about Linux like what is Linux and who started or invented the Linux the Linux advantages and disadvantages and why we are using CentOS 7 or CentOS in this course and we had a look at the Linux file system hierarchy and the second part of the course we have seen how to prepare your lab uh, how to start working with 
the virtual box what is virtual box how to install virtual box on windows how to create your first virtual machine and the installation of the linux centos on the virtual machine and then the third part over here we went through the centos essentials lessons like the moving between directories the pwd how to create files how to delete files and so on with the essential commands of the linux okay now after we have seen those things now you have the basic knowledge about linux that you can start with there are other courses on Udemy about Linux if you would like to learn and know more about Linux. And we will be happy to see you joining any of our courses. And if you have any questions or notes that you would like to tell us, you can contact us on Udemy and we will be very happy to help you. And thank you very, very much for watching.